good morning everyone uh, it is an absolute pleasure to have you all here and it is an honor for me to introduce faculty members to the audience uh, first uh, amritanshu prasad is a professor of mathematics at imsc after completing his b stat at the indian statistical institute kolkata in 1995 he obtained a phd from the university of chicago in 2001 he has been at imsc since 2013 he is a recipient of the 2003 he has been at the imsc since 2003 he is a recipient of the swarna jayanti fellowship and is a fellow of the indian academy of sciences he is the author of representation theory a combinatorial viewpoint published by cambridge university press in 2015 he loves using computers to explore the world of mathematics he is a contributor to the open source mathematical software called sage his current areas of research include representation theory the mathematics of symmetry and combinatorics the study of enumerate discrete structures now i welcome professor amitanshu prasad to deliver the talk what we can learn from continued fractions thank you so i'm going to just uh, talk about uh, continued fraction uh, what do we mathematicians do most of our time well we play so we play with the uh, the world not with the physical world but with the world of mathematics that somehow just out there so we are um, curious about uh, various things that happen in this world we try to discover them and then we also uh, have to uh, write uh, proofs so let me start with a very simple uh, uh, idea which is suppose you have a fraction something like say uh, 34 by 25 okay so uh, everything okay up there right so yeah so uh, so what can you do with this So what do you feel like doing with this? I, I want to know how big it is. So maybe I'll remove the integer parts, right? So let's remove the integer parts. So it, I think 25 goes only once into 34, and then I'm left with 9. So this is a usual step that you must have learned in class five or something like that, right? I, uh, okay, but uh, what we can do is now. we have this 9 by 25 we can take it a little further what we can do is we can write this as 1 plus and now instead of writing this as 9 by 25 which is a proper fraction i'll make this improper i'll write it like this 1 over 25 by 9 okay so now what happened now i have another of these fractions which is uh, you know the numerator is greater than the denominator and so instinctively i feel like again doing that thing uh, taking out the integer part so this becomes 1 over and so now how many times is 9 going to 25 just two times and what do i get uh, 7 by 9 okay so so now you see what's developing here let's try to take it one more step so we have 1 over 2 plus 1 over and now instead of 7 by 9 i'll write 9 by 7 and so that is 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 1 plus uh 2 by 7 right and that again maybe one more step or maybe couple more steps how many more steps do i need let's see so this 2 by 7 becomes 1 over 7 by 2 and this is uh right and i think i just have to do one last step okay. 
and somehow now this process has stopped because I got this uh, 1 here in the numerator 1 over uh, 1 by 2 is just uh, 2 so so nothing new will happen so this this is um, this expression here is the continued fraction uh, expansion of uh, 34 by 25. So we started with this fraction 34 by 25 and we got this sequence of numbers here uh, 1, 2, 1, 3, 2. Okay, so this is like a, a, a different way of expressing a fraction. Okay, you have seen that if you have a real number you can write down its decimal expansion and you can you know the real number is determined by its decimal expansion. So this is something similar it is a different way of writing the number these things are just so we started with a fraction but these things are just integers. So this is called the continued fraction expansion and uh, let us just uh, try to write it a uh, little. Uh, symbolically. So, conceptually what is happening here is that we are starting with uh, a fraction of the form, let us call this first number x0 and the second number x1. Okay, So, x0 is 34, x1 is 25 and we want to understand this, uh, whoops, what is happening? So, we want to understand this uh, x0 by x1 and so what did we do? So, here what we did is we looked at how many times x1 goes into x0 and computed the remainder, right. That is that's a very basic algorithm in, in mathematics going back a few thousand years to uh, it is usually attributed to Euclid, it is called Euclid's algorithm for division. So, uh, so what we will do is uh, we start with x0 and we write it as um, a0 times x1 and then the remainder we call it x2. Okay, so this number here is the remainder. So this is a0 and uh, this is x1, this is x2. And now we are taking at the next stage what are we doing? This is x1 and this is x2, right? So we have gone from solving a certain problem from x0, x1 to solving a problem from x1 and x2, where x2 is the remainder that you got when you divided x0 by x1. Right, so, in general that is what is happening here. So, um, so, the next stage what we would do is we would say x1 is a1 uh, x2 plus x3 um, and then we would write x3 is a2 x3 plus x4 and so on. Does this remind you of something you have learned in school? Hmm? Yeah, okay, but uh, hmm? who's what? What is that? Okay. So, you may have studied uh, GCDs, right, in school? What is, you want to find the GCD of two numbers. So, there is one really annoying way that they first teach you which is you start dividing by all possible things and take out common factors and multiply them, right. And uh, that is fine, it works, but it is really slow. Um, if you, you know, they give you these problems and you just work out for longer. But have you seen another algorithm for doing this? So, there is an algorithm due to Euclid okay, and what it does is so precisely this. So, suppose you want to find the GCD of x0 and x1 
then you run this thing. So for example, if I want to find the GCD of 34 and 25. Okay, so uh, we usually denote GCD by just these round brackets and comma. That's uh, in school though you would write GCD or something, right? Anyway, so you know what I'm talking about. This is the GCD of 34 and 25. So I want to find the largest number that divides both 34 and 25. And uh, if you look at this identity here, Suppose something divides, so, so I want to find the largest number that divides x0 and x1. Now if something divides x0 and x1, then it divides this term and it divides this term. x2 is x0 minus a0 x1. So that means that if something divides x0 and x1, then it will divide x2. And conversely, if something divides x1 and x2, then it will divide x0. So what we are saying is that the GCD of 34 and 25 is the same as the GCD of 25 and uh, 9. And then that is the same as the GCD of, so what was the next thing we got? Uh, 7. And this is the same as the GCD of 7 and 2. Right, this 2 is the remainder when I divide 9 by 7 and this is the same as the GCD of 2 and 1 uh, but the GCD of 2 and 1 is 1. So this shows that, uh, this shows that you know uh, the GCD of 34 and 25 is 1. So the process that is happening while computing the, uh, while computing the continued fraction expansion is the same as this Euclid's algorithm for GCD. And this continued traction expansion thingy it stops uh, at the same time that Euclid's uh, algorithm for the GCD stops. It must stop in finitely many steps because if you think about it, uh, we start with the assumption that x0 is greater than x1. Okay, so we have two numbers, we assume one is greater than the other, and we want to find the GCD. Then this x2 is the remainder. So it has to be uh, it has to be st uh, strictly less than x1 so x0 is strictly greater than x1 which is strictly greater than x2 which is strictly greater than x3 and so on so these are all positive integers but it's a decreasing sequence of positive integers now you can't keep decreasing indefinitely this will stop after finitely many steps um, and so so euclid's algorithm for finding the gcd always terminates and similarly, when you start with a rational number like this, the, uh, the, the continued fraction terminates. So every rational number has a finite continued fraction expansion of this kind. Okay, so, so what? Yeah, it seems rather boring. Um, yeah, I mean so far nothing really, you know, uh, interesting has happened. I have taken a number, I have written it in some funny way. Uh, it's related to some algorithm for GCD, blah blah blah. So, but the the, the game becomes much more interesting when we take uh, x0 and x1 uh, to be arbitrary real numbers, not necessarily not necessarily integers. So, for example, uh, well, so I am in any way interested in the ratio x0 by x1. So, I can take x1 to be 1 and x0 to be my favorite real number. Okay, everybody has a favorite real number. 5, 7, well, those are even integers. Do you have a favorite real number that is not an integer? Pi, yes, yes, that is that's certainly a big favorite there. Um, so, so I could take pi, right? And I could try to compute its continued fraction. So, pi is 3 plus, uh, and then I get some number here, right? Which is uh, roughly 
0.1415 blah 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 so so pi plus something like 0.145 and then I can try to write that as 3 plus 1 over and so I have to take 1 over this which is greater than 1 and so it, it kind of becomes a computational problem right and I can try to do this um, and uh, people have you know played with this uh, for hundreds of years uh, now we have at our disposal a very nice uh, toys uh, as I said mathematicians just play and uh, we have toys to play with uh, well of course the real toys are the numbers themselves but uh, but we have yeah, here is one of my toys so this is uh, how many of you have, uh, know what this is ok so this is uh, sage so it is it's, uh, as you can see here it says uh, sage math is a free open source mathematics software system uh, blah 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 ok so how many of you know what mathematica is Okay. Mathematica, Sage, uh, how many of you know what Python is? Okay, happy that, but some of you do not know what Python is. Okay, so, uh, uh, okay, that is fine, it is never too late to find out about these things. So, uh, so what is Sage? So, it is it's a mathematics software system, that is that's the key point here and uh, you can download it from here it is uh, open source and free so you do not need to pay anything and uh, it is actually a great um, uh, tool even for teaching mathematics uh, teachers uh, can take note but uh, you, you can teach calculus uh, you can teach linear algebra and you can do computations you can compute you can even it even computes integrals for you so so if you <coughs> So let me show you how uh, this works. So, so I'm sort of uh, uh, old-fashioned guy. I, I use this command line here, but there are also um, sort of uh, GUIs for using this. Uh, they are called notebooks, Jupyter notebooks. So now, at the at the lowest level, you know, Sage can just be used as a calculator. So I can ask. Uh, I can ask Sage something like what is 2 plus 2 and it will say ok 2 plus 2 is 4 ok fine um, so your calculator uh, can also do this um, I can do other things like I can ask what is square root of 2 minus 1 uh, something like this um, well, uh, so it's it's not it's refusing to kind of you know it says it's one over square root two minus one is one over square root two minus one. Uh, Sage likes to do things symbolically, but if I ask for the floating point thing, it'll give me a decimal expansion of. Um, okay, but so so it can do all these things. It can do integrals, for example, f of x equals. Uh, e to the well, let us just say sine of x then f dot integrate with respect to x and it gives me minus cos x and I think I can also give like you know integral from here to there it is very powerful. Um, it can solve many of your homework problems in, in the textbook um, if you want to check a trigonometric identity or something there are ways to make it uh, do that um, for today uh, it also has this nice thing called uh, continued fractions so so it has this function called continued fraction list so in general if you want to know something about a uh, function in sage you just type the name of the function and a question mark and the help shows up so return the uh, continued fraction of x as a list so if you know a little python then all this becomes much easier to understand 
Uh, so let's see. So now we can compute continued fractions without really, you know, if you want to compute the continued fraction of pi, then uh, it could take. I mean, if you're doing it by a calculator, it would take quite a lot of time, and you have to keep track of a lot of complicated numbers and so on. So now we can do this very easily. Let's try our. Uh, um, our 34 by 25 that was the one I had written and this gives us uh, 1 to 1 3 2 I hope that that is what I had yeah 1 to 1 3 2 so with uh, very little effort but let's see what happens if I put in some um, some uh, real number that's not a rational number. So rational number, we kind of know what will happen. We'll get this finite sequence, right? So uh, what shall I put in first? Uh, you want to start with pi itself, or uh, I like that idea. Where are you? Ah, okay. So what is the golden ratio? Does Sage know the golden ratio? No, no, it's not 1.61803. It is. I like that answer better. It's uh, so yeah. So it is approximately 1.6, whatever you said, but it is exactly one uh, square root of five plus one over two. It's actually a solution to the equation x squared is x plus one, right? So. Uh, it comes up when you study Fibonacci numbers and various things. So let's look at this. So golden ratio. So yeah, golden ratio. Let's see what it says. Uh, okay, let's see if what you said was correct about one point. Yeah. So this is a approximation. It's an irrational number. It would have an infinite non-terminating uh, decimal expansion, right? And let's try this um, continued fraction. I, I really like your idea. And uh, yeah, so here's a warning though. Uh, it, it, the golden, the continued fraction is infinite. Seems to be infinite. Of course, the computer doesn't know for sure. Uh, did you expect this answer? No, the the uh, young lady who suggested, <laughs> yeah, but it is a very good. Uh, let's look at the golden ratio. Yeah, so here's a very interesting one, right? So the continued fraction expansion of the golden ratio is uh, one 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 one. What's happening here? So um, so let's go back and look at these. Uh, um, yeah, so there's there's another thing that uh, so so we are looking at some number like this golden ratio. Usually, uh, it's denoted by uh, gamma, and uh, it's 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 the positive solution. to the equation x squared minus x minus 1 is equal to 0. And if you work it out, we have gamma equals uh, 1 plus root 5 over 2. Okay, so what we are saying is that this gamma is equal to 1 plus 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1 plus and so on. So to get a better idea of this thing, uh, so now this is, I, I don't know, how do I compute something infinite, right? So let me try to uh, compute something that will approximate this ultimate thing. It's, it's an infinite uh, process, I would never be able to compute it exactly. Uh, so so let's, let's just uh, do a few steps. So the first step, we just have gamma equals 1, right? Uh, first step. So, so let's let's call these. So these are usually called um, uh, 
uh, what are they called uh, uh, convergence so so first i'll have uh, p uh, i guess i call it p0 by q0 my first so so if i take this process and stop it somewhere say i stop it here um, do i have to do this suppose i stop it here then this will be a rational number right i'm not looking at the infinite thing i'm terminating the process after finitely many steps so if i terminate it at the very first step then i get p0 is uh, gamma q0 is uh, no p0 is uh, 1 and q0 is 1 so i get p0 by q0 is 1 this is called the first um would they call it i keep forgetting this word convergent second convergent p1 by q1 is 1 plus 1 over uh, 1 so this is the second convergent which is uh, uh, 2 over 1 right let's go on the third convergent p2 by q2 So I will just add this at this stage. So what do I get now? Uh, so this is 3 by 2 and P3 by Q3 is uh, and this is uh, act turns out to be 5 by 3 and let's just do one more uh, wait a second so am I supposed to write a so this I know actually I am not calculating it turns out to be 8 over 5 um, so, so you are getting these uh, numbers so of course uh, what you are getting in the denominator at each stage seems to be the numerator at the previous stage yeah yeah so what you are getting is 1 2 3 5 8 13, 13. So these are the Fibonacci numbers so the um, the convergence of uh, the convergence of the continued fraction of uh, the golden ratio are the Fibonacci numbers. Actually, Sage also uh, lets us show the convergence. So let's just do that. Uh, so you can specify the number of terms. So I could say I want uh, 20 terms or 10 terms, and I think I could say something like. Uh, partial convergence equals true that means please show me the partial convergence as well and so here you see it it gives you the partial convergence so um, so these uh, ratios 1 by 1 2 by 1 3 by 2 5 by 3 you can think of these as approximations to the golden ratio that come from its partial fraction expansion right so um, this 34 by 21 is going to be uh, let's see what's the difference so float of 34 by 21 minus golden ratio it's it's uh, correct to just uh, two or three decimal places not great um, it's kind of the nature of this golden ratio um, that these convergence they, they kind of converge not that spectacularly but at a very uniform and steady pace towards the golden ratio so um, so what we've discovered here just by playing with this so I said okay what is your favorite number her favorite number is the golden ratio 
we feed it into sage we get uh, the surprising continued fraction not surprising to everybody of course but we get this to many a surprising it would be surprising at some point the first time you see it it has to be surprising so a surprising let's say a surprising continued fraction expansion and then we also find, find this beautiful relationship uh, with the golden ratio now if only we could do something so nice with pi right pi is this golden ratio well it's 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 not such a difficult number to understand pi is a very slippery thing so so let's try this pi uh, so so i'll just change this golden ratio to pi see sage knows everything sage knows i just say pi and it knows that it's pi um, now you see uh, so this first line here uh, this uh, 3 7 15 this oops this stuff up there is um, is actually just the continued fraction expansion so what we are saying is that uh, pi is 3 plus 1 over 7 plus 1 over 15 plus 1 over uh, 1 plus 1 over and so on and these guys here this 3 by 1 ah, 22 by 7 right uh, which is not equal to pi uh, but is a very popular approximation for pi many of your textbook problems are somehow uh, arranged so that you know when you put in this 22 by 7 you get nice answers so um, so there you go that's uh, commonly used rational approximation of pi in fact uh, these uh, all give us nice rational expansions of pi uh, they are optimal in some sense uh, so you may have heard of the astronomer Huygens uh, also I think he worked in optics uh, did a lot of work in mathematics uh, he realized that in fact these partial convergence they actually give you in some sense the best rational approximations to your number best in the sense that when it gives you a denominator you cannot get a better approximation with either that denominator or a smaller denominator ok to get a better approximation you will have to take a larger denominator it is not very difficult if you sit down on a quiet day to figure out why this is true so what we are saying is that this 333 by 106 if you want to improve so let's see what the errors are so let's say float uh, 333 by uh, 106 minus pi so that's the error uh, in this case it's negative and it's given in scientific notation so it's correct to about five decimal places uh, 5 or 4 anyway I, I get confused about this so now um, so anyway so it's 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 correct to 4 or 5 decimal places uh, but see this next thing here this 292 this is huge right so what does this mean that means that if you cut off over here the next term is really small because it's 1 over 292 plus something so if we cut off over here we will get a really good rational approximation of pi let us try that so uh, that next cut off comes at actually 355 by 113 and uh, this is good to uh, 6 or 7 decimal places so with just a slight improvement it's making the denominator slightly larger um, the approximation actually becomes uh, much better so so um, pi really um, you know let's not this 22 by 7 is not so great we should really be using uh, well it's not e uh, of course it's not correct either but it's approximately what maybe you should be using is um, 355 by 113 
So Huygens in fact uh, used this technique for finding good uh, rational approximations. It, it had an application for him in engineering. He wanted to build a planetarium and he needed a certain gear ratio which was a rational number but it was it had some huge denominator which wasn't possible to really make and he used this technique to find a good sort of uh, approximation with a small denominator. So, uh, so that's another uh, uh, yeah. So now this uh, for this golden ratio it's not actually very difficult to show that uh, uh, the continued fraction expansion is just given by this 1, 1, 1, 1. Uh, shall we try to see why that happens? Uh, so, um, so gamma is equal to 1 plus and then we have gamma minus 1, right? So, this is how it starts off. And then this is 1 plus 1 over uh, 1 over gamma minus 1. Now here is the thing about this gamma, 1 over gamma minus 1, so this remember this gamma satisfies the equation that x squared is equal to x plus 1. The way I remember this is that in the Fibonacci sequence you say x n uh, well is x n minus 1 plus x n minus 2, so this is like and uh, so, okay, so, so this is like saying that x to the power of n is x to the power n plus x to the power n minus 2. This is uh, the same as this equation. Okay, so, um, so this actually turns out to be, any guesses? <laughs> yeah, it turns out to be gamma. Let us see if we can prove this. Multiply both sides by gamma. Right, so it actually turns out to be gamma, it is really quite a funny thing. And so this is 1 over 1 plus 1 over gamma. And uh, well, now gamma we start with the same thing right here this is the same as what we had here in the first place so this is yeah it it the same pattern will keep recurring so so this gamma has a really nice uh, uh, for this reason right um, and uh, Mm. Yeah, so maybe I'll write it like this, and then that is again gamma and so on. Uh, one consequence of this uh, argument, it's it's immediately clear that the continued fraction expansion of gamma will never stop because the same thing will keep happening, it is never going to change, so you will keep getting 1, 1, 1, it is never going to stop. But for a rational number the continued fraction expansion must stop because of the, you know, the, the integers keep decreasing. And so uh, what this shows is that in fact gamma is not a rational number, okay. So the golden ratio is not a rational number, there is no, uh, yeah, uh, we could look at other numbers for example, uh, what shall I look at next? i raised to i, is that a real number? Okay, I just looked at square root of 2, okay let us try i raised to i. Firstly, let us see if uh, 
Yeah, so it, it evaluates it as a real number. Mm. Okay. Um, you want to look at its continued fraction. So square root 2 has this really nice continued fraction 1, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. It is almost as simple as a golden ratio. If you want, you can try to see why this is true. It is a similar argument that a certain pattern starts repeating uh, after some point. So let us look at i raised to i over here. I do not know. So, uh, looks like it is also a recurring thing, right? Oops, does not like this, I am surprised. Let us try 25 terms. Uh, yeah, so it looked like it was going to be 1 afterwards, but it is not, right? It is, uh, yeah, so this is, this, this is a bit like pi, it, it does not seem to show any great pattern here. Hmm? Unless you can spot a pattern, um, it does not look to me. Pi had even more jumps. I think we can get more terms if I remove this partial convergence. No? 50 at least? No. It is having trouble with the approximations, uh, things are getting, uh, yeah, okay, 25. Um, we can look at pi also. So you see there is there's no really nice pattern here. Um, what else shall we look at? E. E is actually my, maybe my, one of my favorite real numbers. Um, so do you see a pattern here? So what is the pattern? It is like, okay, so in the beginning there is like 2, 1, but then after that it is 2, 1, 1, 4, 1, 1, 6, 1, 1, 8, 1, 1, 10, 1, 1, that's, that's beautiful. It is, it is beautiful, it is not that simple, it is not something as simple as the golden ratio, it looks like there is something a little more complicated happening over here. And uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this continued fraction was uh, known to, uh, um, I think it was known to Euler. Uh, but this continued fraction is historically uh, very, very important. Uh, it, it was, um, so this uh, number E, so what is E firstly? What is E really? Why should you take that limit? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. So there are many ways of defining E. I can take it as limit as one plus as n tends to infinity, as one plus one over n raised to the power n, or I can take it as sum n goes from zero to infinity. 1 over n factorial. That is 1 plus 1 over 1 factorial plus 1 over 2 factorial. This actually the second thing I like a lot because um, it actually comes from a more general equation e to the power x. So the thing is suppose you are looking for a function that is its own derivative, right. So if you take sin x, its derivative is cos x, if you take cos x, its derivative is minus sin x. So the second derivative of sin x is the negative of sin x. But I want a function that is its own derivative. And that is that's the function uh, which is usually, you know, well, so maybe it is called the x function. So if I, if you just think about it a bit, you have to, write, so suppose this function has some, you know, expansion like this. Uh, um, a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared and if you term wise differentiate and insist that the result should be equal to the original function then you will end up with this 1 plus x over 1 factorial plus x squared over 2 factorial plus 
x cubed over 3 factorial. And you can show that then this function has the property that x of x plus y is x of x into x of y. So it acts like taking powers. And it turns out that it is a power of a very special number called e which is the value of this function at x equals 1. So this is x of 1. And uh, it is very tricky to go from uh, this description of e as 1 plus uh, 1 over 1 factorial plus 1 over 2 factorial to uh, this continued fraction expansion. This is perhaps, um, it is much harder than what we did for the golden ratio and square root 2. Um, <coughs> I was actually uh, uh, thinking of um, uh, giving a proof of this to you, but I think it will take too much time. Uh, instead, let me give you a reference. There's, uh, there's, um, uh, so, have you heard of this magazine called the American Mathematical Monthly? So, I actually hadn't heard of it in school, but I started reading it in college. Uh, it's 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 a magazine published by the American Mathematical Society, and they have uh, mostly college level articles. Very 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 lovely. And uh, okay, so coming back to this, uh, this. Uh, uh, continued fraction expansion of E is very important. So here, uh, 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 so if you take, for example, square root two, right? Then it is the solution of an equation x squared minus two equals zero. Right? And the golden ratio is the solution to the equation x squared minus x minus 1 equals 0. Now, uh, so now you know that there are uh, integers, then there are rational numbers which are ratios of integers, but they are actually a lot more numbers. They are numbers like square root of 2 and gamma and e and pi. These are not rational numbers. But further among rational, uh, these irrational numbers, there are numbers which are solutions to polynomial equations with integer coefficients. Those are called algebraic numbers. Okay, so you can still get a grip on those numbers to define them you can say okay, you know, uh, it's, at a, it's a solution of this equation and then maybe you can use some numerical method to get approximations. Then there are numbers like E which do not seem to satisfy any polynomial equation. So, you cannot write down an equation x to the power 500 plus 345 x to the power 432. You cannot write any equation, uh, polynomial equation with integer coefficients whose solution is E. How do we know that? So, that is not something that is easy to see. Uh, but it has been known for a long time. Uh, there was a mathematician called Hermite, a French mathematician and he proved that E does not have, does not solve any polynomial equation. And in order to prove that, this is uh, 1873. E is a transcendental number. In fact, uh, one of my colleagues is uh, going to give this proof in a course at uh, the Chennai Mathematical Institute probably next uh, week or so. So, but, but the starting point for this proof is to establish this uh, continued fractions expansion for E. Actually, you need to do a little more. You need to find continued fractions expansions for powers of E. And then you have to somehow, it's, 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 this is the easy part in fact, but this part is already kind of uh, tricky. So, 
So Hermit uh, actually uh, computed these uh, continued fraction expansion of, uh, proved that the continued fraction expansion of E is this. And uh, there's a, uh, uh, yeah. So there's this article in the uh, American Math Monthly. This is something that uh, anybody who likes calculus and a little bit of uh, yeah, basically just need a little calculus, a short proof of the simple continued fraction expansion of E. So uh, yeah, so Euler, uh, so that is uh, around, uh, let's see, Euler was uh, 1744, he realized this continued fraction expansion. Um, he actually, I think, worked with that series which defines E uh, to establish this. But the proof is harder and this, uh, so he says one of the most interesting proofs is due to Hermit. Uh, it arose as a byproduct of his proof of the transcendence of E. Um, so, so, um, so this, this article gives a very nice short proof. And interestingly, it involves computing these three, well, not computing, but proving certain relationships between these three very um, uh, fairly simple looking, I don't know, simple, depends on, yeah, what you eat for breakfast, uh, these integrals. So I, if you, if you, you know, you, you can um, uh, try to get hold of this article and uh, you can write to me, I can email it to you. So, but it should be available on the internet. Uh, so, proof of the transcendence of E. Now, just to go a little further, we've only looked at uh, you know, the tip of the iceberg of the theory of continued fractions. And we've been looking only at continued fractions of the form, uh, of the form uh, like this. So, we've been looking at continued fractions of the form 1 plus 1 over, no, A0 plus 1 over A1 plus 1 over A2. But uh, sometimes it is interesting to also allow numbers over here. So I could perhaps allow B0, B1, B2. Now this will not be a uniquely determined continued fraction. But let me give you an example. So Euler, Euler, the master of all mathematicians, he gave a continued fraction expansion of pi. See, we, we tried to do this and we found that there was no pattern in those coefficients. But that's because we were insisting that these things be 1. But Euler actually gave this just absolutely amazing formula. You get the idea. So, um, so actually, Euler has some very interesting uh, uh, mode. You know, he, this is part of many things that he did with uh, continued fractions. And uh, let me just end by writing down a formula of Ramanujan. Uh, well, it's actually Rogers and Ramanujan continued fraction and uh, what it says, so let me just write it down and uh, if you do not understand what it is saying, that is fine, but sometimes it is nice to just uh, maybe, it, I do not know. So, 1 minus q raised to 5n minus 4, so 1 and 4 here, 2 and 3 in the denominator. Okay, so this is going to be my number whose continued fraction I want. So it is not a number really, it is a function of one variable q. But if you want, you can substitute a value of q between uh, with absolute value less than 1. And this is what Ramanujan wrote down. Yeah, 
this is Q. Now, my Q's are looking like nines, but there are no nines in this, okay, so only Q's. And this is stunningly simple. So there's a whole sort of, um, you know, mathematical theory where instead of looking at continued fractions of, um, of just numbers, we look at continued fraction expansions of functions. And uh, this is this is uh, this Rogers Ramanujan identity is uh, is uh, one of those. Okay, so maybe uh, I'll uh, I'll stop with these two uh, stunning and deep examples of continued fraction expansions. I hope that uh, you know I have convinced you that uh, the world of mathematics out there is full of. Uh, mysteries, some of which are very close to the surface, you just need to look. Like this continued fraction expansion of E, you just, I mean, just playing with the, the right tools, ask a few basic questions, you stumble upon it and uh, it's, it's actually a fairly uh, deep uh, result. Uh, these are again now, this is a different level altogether, even harder results. And uh, it's it's fun. I mean, this is what we do, uh, mathematicians. We play. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you for the wonderful talk, Professor. Uh, the questions are open to the participants. Anyone wants to ask the question, please raise your hand and ask the question. Yeah, please introduce yourself. Yeah, uh, hi, I'm Manu from BVM. I just want to know, so in this Rogers and Manujam identity, what's the significance of having Q to the E1 over 5 on both sides? Like I understand you can just equate the product of 1 over 1 plus Q plus. <laughs> so just, uh, sorry, I could have ditched that, yeah. Good, good question. Uh, it has something to do with uh, something called modularity. So, uh, yeah, let's, let me report it. But yeah, you... I just copied this down from you. This is one way of writing it. Yeah, you don't need the Q raised to 1 over 5, but since you asked, it has something to do with the phenomenon called modularity. When you put that in, these functions have some nice uh, symmetric prop symmetry properties. You can do a change of variables and get uh, functions which it transforms well under certain changes of variables. So, um, thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, in the back. Um, so, uh, I'm Shridi from PSVB KK Nagar. I have two doubts. Um, specifically, do you have an inverse function for the continued fractions? Uh, like, you've expanded a fraction to so many different fractions. Right. So, is there an inverse function to get it back to the original fraction? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I probably uh, briefly mentioned this. Uh, so, the technique, it is not that straightforward, but this is it. So, uh, you have these uh, convergence, right? So, you compute the convergence and there are formulas for computing the convergence uh, recursively just in terms of these. Um, so, if I have this partial fraction expansion uh, like this. Uh, my number uh, x is equal to a0 plus 1 over a1 plus 1 over a2. So, you terminate this at n steps and you call that pn by qn. Then there are formulas, recursive formulas for computing pn in terms of pn minus 1. I can tell you the exact formula. And then, but then after that you have to take a limit. So, so you can compute Pn as uh, An Pn minus 1 plus Pn minus 2, Qn as An Qn minus 1 plus Qn minus 2 and uh, you have to figure out the initial conditions what is, uh, uh, what are P0 and Q0, uh, I guess uh, P0 and Q0 are 1 and 1, uh, no maybe A0 and 1, yeah. 
and uh, so anyway so using these formulas you can compute pn by qn and then you have to compute the limit as n tends to infinity pn by qn and that will give you x um, so this all this needs some proof uh, but it's it's a well studied thing another thing is suppose the continued fraction is recurring right so for example for uh, this golden ratio we had uh, this thing right so then this straight away gives you that gamma is equal to 1 plus 1 over gamma and from that you can solve for gamma so in some special cases you might be if it's a recurring thing you will be able to typically you'll be able to write out a quadratic equation that uh, number satisfies but in complete generality you have to compute the uh, convergence using these uh, these kinds of uh, identities and uh, you can uh, then then compute the limit uh, just another doubt um for continued uh, fractions you have that a integer so can these a integers be similar for fractions or are they specifically unique uh, so if you don't have the b's then the a's are uni uniquely determined by the number that you started with so do you have a relation between two fractions which have the same a integers they have to be equal they have to be equal if you don't allow it yeah in this so the no so see here we did it right there's only one way to do this whole process this continued fraction expansion it, it it's a deterministic process at each stage you find the quotient you put the remainder and then you continue now there's another now later when i wanted to talk about this uh, euler's uh, thing for pi this is a different kind of continued fraction right? here i'm not putting one these i'm not putting one here i'm putting something different then it's not unique okay and then any any kind of thing can happen uh, for example the number pi you can also look at another number where the a's are the same but the b's are different so i can look at 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over this number is uh, nothing to do with pi let's call it y this number will be a solution of a quadratic equation you can actually figure out what it is here is a nice exercise what is y so there then there's no relation if you allow these b's to change uh, any questions from the upstairs audience okay then uh, thank you once again for this very wonderful talk professor thank you gopal give a huge round of applause for the professor amitandu prasad i would like to call professor manjari bagchi to deliver the talk neutron stars the best natural laboratories to do physics experiments okay so good morning everyone so in your school you do lots of physics experiment right so there are means your teachers have set the lab so i will tell you about something like uh, where nature has made a very nice laboratory for us a very special kind of stars uh, it's uh, called neutron stars probably you have heard about proton neutrons uh, electrons and these stars are made mo mostly of neutrons and they have very peculiar properties because of that means you can use them as your laboratory to test various theories of gravity means to, uh, gravity particle physics many things so in your lab you have different uh, experimental setup to do different uh, experiment right but here you can use uh, one thing one laboratory actually you have lots of such laboratories uh, so, but the similar thing you can use for various experiment you don't need to construct uh, 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 anything so i don't know where you live and how good is the night sky for your uh, uh, home 
But if it is say load shedding or anything, power cut, if you go outside and look at the sky, all this full of stars, have you ever noticed that some of the stars look different? Like here I show you much my most favorite constellation, Orion, and this is one star, it's a very reddish, for what we call Betelgeuse, its name. Uh, and just opposite, it is the Regal, it is a bit bluish. And near the Orion, there is the dog star or Sirius, which is like normal, nothing special. Uh, okay. And if you see by just with your own eyes, you will see there are only one star. But if you have a good telescope, you will see another small star with this. So actually this Sirius which we see, we call it Sirius A and that small star we call Sirius B. And both are actually gravitationally bound to each other like Sun and Earth are bound to each other. But here uh, uh, they orbit around each other. So those type of stars we call binary star. Uh, so they are also different in uh, nature. So uh, you know there are different stars different in nature and this Sirius or Sirius A, this is actually very normal means it is white like our sun, you know what uh, sunlight is we call white light, right? But this is actually combination of different colors, right? If you put sunlight through prism you see the uh, all vizios. So what about this regal means which is bluish? It also has different frequencies, different color, but it has more of the blue part. Similarly, Betelgeuse, it also has other frequencies, but the, its brightness is more in the red wavelength. And not only the optical wavelength, but you know this visible light, it is a part of electromagnetic waves, right? The property of this light is same as X-ray, uh, the radio, the signal of your uh, mobile phone, that radio wavelength, and on the other hand, X-ray, uh, which X-ray you do when you break your bone, all are similar type of waves, right? Electromagnetic waves, depending on frequency, means our eyes have been evolved to see only some particular uh, a part of the electromagnetic wave that we call optical or visible wave, uh, visible range, and there we have this range we can see. So it is not that stars which we have, uh, we see, uh, it is not that they only emit optical wavelengths. We see only the optical wavelengths, but they emit everything. They emit radio, X-ray, gamma ray, and uh, some stars emit more X-ray, less optical, some stars emit more radio, but uh, they emit everything. So if you have special detector, you can uh, see other things. But say old, old, olden days when people did not know and did not have detector to detect X-ray, means X-ray or gamma ray or radio we cannot see, right? You need detector. For radio you need a, a radio detectors, means t like TV antenna, like antenna. For X-ray you need X-ray plate. But in earlier days invisible we could see only the optical uh, light, right? In that way also we saw the different stars are different. So now let us look at this diagram. Here this horizontal axis is uh, increasing wavelength. So you know that red is higher wavelength and blue is uh, shorter wavelength. So this is increasing wavelength and it happens as it is blackbody means red is actually lower temperature and blue is higher temperature. So this is increasing, uh, decreasing temperature, increasing uh, temperature. So that might be confusing. So just uh, because usually when we plot something, our x-axis goes increasing some parameter which we are plotting, right? So this is increasing wavelength. And here this is brightness. How bright is our star? So first people started to plot, uh, means just put start me measure their wavelength uh, and uh, put them in this diagram. So most of the star you see red star are fainter means uh, this is their br uh, brightness. 
So red star are fainter, if they become yellowish, then white, then bluer, they become brighter and brighter. This is something like lower temperature is fainter, higher temperature is brighter and bluer. That is something similar to not exactly same means when you heat a piece of iron, it first become red. Then if it become hotter, it become bluish. It is a kind of that. So uh, those are what we expect. And those are uh, stars, uh, our sun also the, the, uh, follows this expected relation. So in this diagram, the uh, sun is just here. Sun is a very much white, little yellowish object. But then you will see there are some stars, as, as we said, that like Betelgeuse, it is very red, but it is very bright also. Means usually we expect that if you know, something has its wavelength so red region, it would be very faint. But Betelgeuse is very bright. Then Regal, I already mentioned in Syria, uh, uh, Orion, uh, so Regal is very uh, moderately bluish and it is also very bright. So what are they? They are actually super giant. Means they are very big and very uh, bright. But they are, so they are something special, right? We will come to uh, them. But they are not the only uh, unnatural means, uh, you can say abnormal things of which do not follow our expectation. There are other stars, like I say, with Sirius, there is Sirius B, which is a very faint and very blue. So here we say that we expect blue stars to be very bright. But you see very faint bluish Start. We call them white dwarfs. Means they are bluish, but we, uh, sometimes they can be whitish also. We, but they are very, very faint. They are in this region. We call them uh, it's white dwarfs. What are they? Uh, so we'll come. And this diagram we call color magnitude diagram. So th this was very means like in chemistry periodic table is basic and. When you first go to primary school, that multiplication table you memorize. So this is the fundamental uh, diagram of any kind of astronomy. Whereas it tells us a many interesting things. And this I already uh, said that we see only some part of this is the uh, increasing wavelength and different types of electromagnetic waves. So. Uh, lower wavelength means higher frequency, you have gamma rays, then X-rays, ultraviolet, then your optical region wh where you have this uh, it's a blue to red range and then infrared, microwave, radio waves and very long radio waves. So if you have your uh, detector, you can detect X-rays or gamma rays coming from uh, the various stars. Now the question is that means I have already shown you this, so are they very, uh, very different or is there any relation between a supergiant and a main sequence star? So let us see this. So actually the answer is yes, there is a relation, means different types of stars are actually different uh, uh, stages of uh, life. Like for human beings also, right? A old person with white hair and a newborn baby, they don't look the same. And if you think of butterflies, caterpillar and butterflies, they are the same, they look totally different. So uh, same star in different period of its life can look different. So here say if we have a average means, so main sequence is the mid stage of life, it's maybe like uh, stages when for human life it is a 40 year old human being. So uh, that is like sun like star which emits heat and uh, it's a, it's a radiation. Then when it grows old it become red giant and then finally when it dies its dead body is uh, the white dwarf. But I will tell you why uh, so we still see means we are seeing white dwarfs like Sirius uh, B, it, that means they still emit. Dead star was not supposed to emit, uh, but they still emit. Why and how that uh, will come. 
but so this is something like stars like our sun when it will grow old it will become a very faint white dwarf but before that it will become a red giant and you know when sun will become red giant it will be so big that even earth will become in, uh, inside the sun so uh, we'll all go to sun by, by that time but it is millions of years we have to wait but if you have a very massive star say 50 times heavier than sun, uh, sun then when it grows old it becomes a red super giant it's very very big very very bright and when it dies that death is very explosive uh, that means there is some explosion uh, we call supernova explosion and after that means outer part of the stars being uh, ejected out and the inner part collapse and if this massive star mass was not that high maybe up to 20 times heavier than sun they become a kind of object which we will uh, talk more today called neutron star so they are also a kind of dead star but we still see them we will discuss and if this original star was very massive then it become a black hole and this uh, there are other ways of black hole formation also but this is the main way how a, a black holes form so black hole means the name says means they are very co uh, the compact very dense so that we say that their gravity is so strong that if they had some mechanism to generate light that light could not come but they also do, do not have any uh, source of light generation so we will discuss more about neutron star and to understand neutron star we will need to discuss a little bit of white dwarf now uh, so before discussing them i want to convince you that this neutron stars and a little bit of white dwarfs also they are very peculiar first what about mass so here you see i use a symbol m and then uh, a circle and a dot so that actually we astronomers borrowed from Egyptians and said Egyptian you know they had their uh, alphabet called hieroglyphic it is pixel like so this was the, the uh, symbol in hieroglyphic symbol for sun so we astronomers use this m sun means mass of sun which is uh, 1.9 into 10 to the power 3 kg so if you ever say something I say uh, 2 m sun or 2 solar mass that means uh, mass of that star is 2 into this so every time saying this huge number is inconvenient so we just say things in terms of uh, the, the mass of sun and this is radius of sun so this is 7 into 10 to the power 5 kilometer so sometimes we express things in terms of radius in terms of our sun also now see main sequence star means obviously mass of sun is 1 m sun but sun is not the only main sequence star means in very normal white which is follows the expectation that uh, the low uh, the temperature stars are fainter then they be, you become hotter and you uh, get brighter star so you get those type of main sequence stars masses in the range of 0.1 means lighter than sun to 50 solar mass then you come to white dwarf means this like they become red giant means main sequence starts become red giant when the, 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 their masses are in the range of 0 0.1 to 10 solar mass and they become white dwarf means they explore means their outer side of elements being uh, expelled and the inner part uh, becomes a white dwarf so masses of white dwarfs in the range of 0 0.2 to 1.4 solar mass and the heavier main sequence uh, mass is in the range of 10 to 50 solar mass they become neutron star but when they become neutron star uh, uh, well uh, only 10 to 20 region become neutron star they they are masses when they con become neutron star their masses are in the range of 1 to 2 solar mass means after a very heavy uh, the star it grows old it dies in a supernova explosion it ex it expels lots of its mass and the inner part to uh, two solar mass part it uh, becomes a neutron star 
uh, so uh, the neutrostar can be uh, masses anything in the range of 1 to 2 solar mass. So, now uh, so as we know, uh, sorry, so here you see white dwarf can be of any mass between 0.2 and 1.4, main sequences can be of any mass between 0.1 to 50 solar mass. Now I am going to compare densities. So then it will help us if I take uh, so one sample from uh, each right. So later uh, uh, so I have taken one main sequence star. Say if I have taken uh, sun. Uh, so its uh, so, uh, mass is one solar mass. White dwarf masses can be uh, various, but I have chosen a particular white dwarf whose mass is one solar mass. I have taken one neutron star of mass one solar mass, one black hole of mass one uh, solar mass. So, my radius of the sun as in kilometer is 7 into 10 to the power 5 kilometer. And radius, any question? I think someone has something saying. So, if you have any question, uh, please raise your hand instead of talking to friends. So, if you have a white dwarf of the same mass, one solar mass, its radius is 7 into 10 to the power 3 kilometer. So, radius is 100 times smaller. So, you can calculate the density, right? Density is mass by volume and volume is 4 by uh, 3 pi r cube, right? So, you can say that density of as radius is 100 times smaller, so uh, density volume is much 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 smaller right because its volume is r to the power cube. So, density of white dwarf is much much uh, higher. Now, think about neutron star, same mass neutron star, but radius is only 10 kilometer. Only 10 kilometer, can, uh, can you believe? So, diameter is 20 kilometer. So, I was checking that from here, you know, there is another institute CMI near Siruseri. So, distance from IMSC to Siruseri is al uh, almost like that. So, uh, think about the sun is so big, 10 to the power 5 kilometer radius and same mass uh, just uh, squeezed into a, uh, a sphere of 10 kilometer radius. So, the density of neutron star are extremely high. So, that is one peculiarity of them, right? The, uh, the, means all these peculiarities uh, make them special so that we can use them as our laboratory. But this extreme high density is not the everything. There is also magnetic field. So you, you know you play with Fritz magnet or magnets in your lab. So you know the uh, magnetic field we measure in well, probably the, in this generation you uh, measure in Tesla. But in old fashioned way we astronomers prefer to measure in another unit Gauss. So one Tesla is at uh, 10 to the power 4, oh, I, I missed or it's 1, 3. Uh, so, freeze magnet, uh, uh, its strength is 50 Gauss. Uh, earth, uh, you know, Earth has also a magnetic field, right? There is a, a geomagnetic storm and everything. So, the magnetic field of Earth in the range uh, of 0.25 to 0.65 means it is less than 1 Gauss. So, main sequence star their magnetic field lies between 1 to 100 Gauss and for sun it is most of the places 10 Gauss. White dwarf, their magnetic field is stronger means 10 to the power 3 to 10 to the power 9 Gauss and neutron star, they are even stronger magnet 10 to the power 9 to 10 to the power 15 uh, Gauss. So, can you uh, imagine means when we play with freeze magnet even this 50 Gauss magnets seem very strong, they, uh, can, uh, they can pick up safety pin and they, you can do uh, so many things. But think of uh, neutron star, means their magnetic field is so high. So this extreme high magnetic field also make them very weird. Now there is another thing, the spin. You know earth rotates around its own axis, right? That is why we have day and night. That is, and Earth takes uh, means how we define one day or 24 hours to make a complete rotation around its axis that we call spin period. 
so our spin period is one day that is the definition of day but you, uh, i don't know whether you uh, say uh, you know the uh, most of the stars and uh, same as, uh, other objects in the uh, universe they ev everybody spins around their own axis so sun sun also rotates around its own axis but sun co uh, uh, completes one rotation in almost 25 day so the sun is a bit slow rotator white dwarfs defined white dwarfs uh, spin period is different but it is uh, usually in the range of 0.01 to 4.2 days whatever neutron stars they rotate very fast means uh, it has their spin period that is in the range of at, at uh, 0.0014 or 1.4 millisecond to almost like at 11.8 second so as you consider means a neutron star it has same mass as sun but sun is taking 25 days but a neutron star is taking only a few second to complete one rotation so this very fast rotation also make them unique we will discuss as all them now uh, what is sun uh, means we want to understand what are neutron stars uh, and we said that neutron stars are dead stars so first let us uh, start from what are stars so uh, what is sun made of which we know sun uh, is uh, uh, mostly hydrogen and helium gas right but as uh, in your physics textbook what is the definition of gas means it is a fluid right means it will take the it will just spread so if now i get a can of hydrogen and i remove the lid the hydrogen gas will spread uh, throughout the room right so how sun exists uh, in vacuum means why sun has a shape spherical shape it should be just diffused right but it is not happening that so why because it is a huge clump right as i say mass of the uh, sun is 10 to the power 30 kg so you have say a big blob of uh, hydrogen gas so say you have a particle as a hydrogen atom at the outside near the surface so all other particle inside they are attracting it towards the center right that is why it cannot go it cannot spread over now you'll say okay that i understand but then why it is not it's collapsing like uh, 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 apple uh, 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 as i'm thinking of uh, gravity means uh, the fruits from from the trees to the earth due to gravity then why all these particles they are not falling towards the center because gravitational force is attracting all particles towards center but there is another force which is giving outward pressure so there is a balance and that balance become uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, minimized and you get a stable structure when you get a spherical shape and where this outward force is coming uh, so have you read that Charles law Boyle's law so you know that PV equal to NKT right so if temperature is high you get a pressure right so this because there is uh, high temperature in, inside the star uh, there is a pressure and that pressure is balancing gravity so there is a balance we get a stable star now uh, like sun we, if we go outside uh, it is so hot right because sun is emitting energy heat and electromagnetic wave so it is losing energy is it cooling down why it is still uh, uh, hot inside because it is hot that is why it can emit energy right because star, uh, sun is this type of star which we call alive star there is nuclear fusion going on as it started with mostly hydrogen then uh, uh, two you know uh, inside hydrogen means you have uh, it is usually in nu uh, nuclei means one proton right then there are lots of hydrogen uh, uh, atom and you have hydrogen uh, nuclei so they fuse together and they form uh, helium right and this is called nuclear fusion and you need to give some initial energy uh, to start nuclear fusion it's, but say you give uh, give some amount of energy say you give 
five joule energy to start some nuclear fusion. But when nuclear fusion happens, it will give lots of, uh, more energy. Means you initially give uh, the, the five joule, and probably you will get uh, get five hundred joule. So that is why means initially it uh, it was little bit hot, but there is a nuclear fusion going on. It is uh, generating lots of heat. So it is emitting heat, but it is still hot, and there is a stability between everything generation of heat, emission of heat, and a pressure between uh, due to this temperature and inward gravity. So we have this type of uh, stable balance star. Now, sorry. Now what happens after some time means? After some time, means nuclear this fusion generation of heat cannot happen for ever. Means after all hydrogen fused together helium, then depending upon the mass and initial condition, the heliums can fuse together to form carbon. For some stars, you can get oxygen, silicon, and uh, iron. But eventually, this nuclear fusion stops. So that time when nuclear fusion uh, stopped, that time start uh, keep uh, keep on emitting light, right? That time starts start, uh, starts to cool down. So that time this pressure, outward pressure due to uh, gas pressure, uh, uh, that starts to decrease, right? So gravity starts to win. So what will gravity do? The uh, gravity will squeeze. Now, uh, see uh, here I see. Uh, uh, look at this diagram uh, i have plotted some atoms means to make it more instructive not hydrogen atom but some atom you see uh, uh, those are nuclei means you know uh, uh, inside any atom uh, there is nucleus where you have uh, protons charged neutral and uh, sorry uh, positively charged and neutron uh, neutral and there is electron or uh, in different orbits right and Electrons, uh, so here those blue, uh, th uh, this is the uh, nuclei, the, uh, the, the, we, uh, we have four atoms here, Th those are four nuclei and two electrons around it. So you can see electrons, you ca cannot break their orbit, means electrons have to be in this uh, orbit, you cannot bring this electron closer uh, here. So when you squeeze, means first say there, there is some space between this atom, if gravity squeeze them, those atoms will come close together, but they cannot come very clo uh, uh, closer together. Means those electron orbits they cannot overlap uh, together. So that time uh, the squeezing will stop. But if the mass of the star was very heavy, what will it do? Means it can break the atom. Uh, so if it break the atom, what will happen? The electrons become free from its orbital structure, and that time, see, you you have this tiny nuclei, uh, nucleus, and there is another tiny nucleus. You can bring them very close together. So look at this uh, plot. Means here, this four nuclei. Uh, you can uh, I uh, I have uh, taken more nuclei, but uh, means you have lots of nuclei in a small region, and electrons are free just uh, roam around. So you will say, okay, that is good. So can we keep on bringing nuclei closer and closer, closer? We could, uh, but there is some quantum mechanical property of electrons that you will learn when uh, you study MSc, that electrons and actually uh, these protons and neutron also, they are a special type of particle called fermion. And the particles which we call fermions, they don't like each other. Means two fermions, they cannot come very close together. So you have free electrons, you can, cannot uh, bring them very close together. If you try to bring them very uh, close, they will uh, give some pressure against your effort. So that pressure is called degeneracy pressure, which uh, comes from advanced uh, physics, quantum mechanics. So now you say that uh, you are squeezing the cold star, uh, so you have uh, as your atoms broke, you have nuclei and free electrons 
and because you are squeezing free electrons are uh, giving degeneracy pressure against gravity. And if these two opposite force balances each other, you again get some stable structure. That is the white dwarf stage. Means after death of star, you uh, squeezed, that is why white dwarfs are smaller and denser because there is no mass loss, right? So, uh, but you get stable structure because of electron pressure. But see, if I say that um, uh, 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 white dwarfs are formed if the original star was 1 to 10 solar mass, but you have higher mass stars. What happens if the in, uh, uh, initial stars are heavier? Then the gravity is so strong that degeneracy pressure due to electron cannot balance. So what will get gravity do? Gravity is very powerful. Gravity will break the nuclei. And it is difficult to draw here. It's if you study the nuclear st structure, inside we talk about atomic structure, right? There is a nucleus, electrons are in orbit. But inside the nucleus also, proton and neutrons cannot be uh, anywhere. They also follow some uh, orbital structure. So they cannot, in no normal situation, uh, so, uh, so there is some finite size of the nuclei and uh, you know, proton and neutrons are in different orbit. So gravity can do one thing, first it will bring the nu uh, two nucleus by two hands, they, uh, they will come very close together. Then uh, gravity, if st even higher, then gravity will break the, like earlier it broke the atomic structure, now it will break the nuclear uh, structure then you will get free proton and free neutron. Then something interesting happens. See, you already had free electrons, right? And uh, now you have free proton and free neutron. But protons are positively charged and electrons are negatively charged, right? You have a red Coulomb's uh, law, right? It's a positive charge and negative charge, they attract each other. So electrons and protons will attract each other a proton will absorb an electron and will become a neutron. So you had already neutrons, but all the protons will also become neutrons. So you will get a matter, or more, only neutron matter. And neutrons are also this peculiar type of object, fermions. Neutrons also don't like each other very much. So when you try to bring those free neutrons very close together, they will give a opposite pressure, degeneracy pressure. And in some case, those uh, neutron degeneracy pressure can balance the inward gravity, that is our neutron star. So they are weird, right? That is why they are so dense, because you broke the atom, you squeeze the atom, and then you squeeze the nuclear uh, also. And in some cases, if gravity is so high that even nuclear uh, neutron degeneracy pressure cannot balance it, there will be ultimate collapse, you get black hole. So we will not discuss much about black hole, we will discuss mostly about uh, mm, uh, neutron star. So, uh, uh, so you know, uh, know how, uh, what are neutron star and they are weird, right? Because in a normal day we think about seeing uh, 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 atoms, but there is no more atoms, they are mostly free neutrons. And that is why neutron star help us to study particle physics, study formation of different types of elements of your periodic tables, uh, then superfluidity, magnetism, gravity, many things. So today we cannot discuss everything. I will just briefly mention about particle physics, atomic physics and gravity. So let us start from particle physics. So, uh, so far I uh, uh, told you that if, yes. 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 Break. Yes. Uh, it is possible. That is why there is a, 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 a limit. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I said that the spin of neutron star is, it, uh, it is a very good uh, question, uh, is from 1.4 millisecond to 
uh, there is no problem of being a uh, slow we had seen only up to 12 seconds but uh, it cannot this spin period cannot be lower than 1 millisecond then it will break up apart so gravity can hold the neutron stay because the, uh, it is very strong gravity right all this one solar mass squeeze into 10 ro uh, rotation but because if, if you try to rotate the sun uh, in one uh, second it will break apart due to centrifugal force but neutron star they do not break uh, even up to one millisecond but if you make try to, uh, to rotate a neutron star in one spin in one microsecond it will break apart there is a limit yes okay Huh. Yes. It will just break. No, super. Uh, 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 it will not become supernova. It will become something which we call kilonova, and uh, that actually can happen. Means if two uh, neutron stars, means you don't need God to interfere, but natural phenomena can do. And say two neutron star, if they orbit around each other and then they merge, that time this is a violent process. A neutron star can start and it can break apart. That happens. Yes, it is a reality of life. So that that was a very good question. So now the question is that we said that you can see. You remember in class seven or eight, first we say that. Or, uh, atoms, uh, molecules, and atoms. That time, probably that Avogadro's theory. We say atoms are unbreakable part of uh, uh, objects, right? Now we know atoms are not unbreakable. Atoms are made of protons and neutrons. It's, so probably you say that protons and neutrons are unbreakable particles, right? But it is not exactly. Protons and neutrons are not also. Uh, a fundamental particle uh, means they are also not the tiniest particle so they are composed of three smaller particle we call them quarks so there are different types of quark a proton is made of two u quark one d quark and one neutron is two d quark and one uh, uh, u quark but there are other type of quarks means uh, particle physicists have seen them so in our see in our normal everything everything is made of different co combination of neutron and protons right and they are all made of u and d quark but if you go to very unnatural situation you uh, in particle physics lab very high energy very high magnetic field okay, there are other quarks and all uh, the, the various combination of three of those quarks can may, uh, make other type of particle means so the, uh, the particles which have three quarks we call them in general baryons so like even with u and d quark you can have a particle with three up quark or u quark or three uh, d quark but you can have particles with other quarks and particle physicists have seen those particles but particle physicists uh, to detect those particles they need to make very big very fancy experiments so this is the one uh, the city in Germany, which has like, a few particle physics experiment. Those are the, this is the whole city, uh, and those are the uh, instruments, and they are very big. Probably this, uh, uh, you cannot see, understand the scale, but here in this, here you can see there is this, this is a human being. So you can see this, uh, the uh, human being is so tiny. Right, so those instruments are so big, but we, uh, what they do in those experiments, they have very high energy, high magnetic field, but we know neutron stars inside, they are very compact, they have very high magnetic field, so perhaps we, there is some proposal that inside neutron star, there are those exotic particles. So we do not know because we cannot just go inside neutron star uh, and see who, uh, we call them neutron star but whether there are other types of particles inside them. 
So that is still theory, means there are lots of effort to think about what can be observable signature from the neutron star so that we can tell what is in the center, uh, whether the, those exotic particles are there in the center. Some people think if uh, say gravity is very high, then in the center or maybe throughout, those neutrons will uh, break and you will get free quarks. And quarks are also those peculiar objects called fermion. They also do not like each other. So they can also give design separation. Whether the stars are uh, uh, balanced by those uh, quark uh, design separation. So th those are theory we do not know because it's uh, observable signature is very difficult. But now in this generation of gravitational wave, probably within next few, uh, few years, five or 10 years, we will know better. Probably when you are a researcher, you will tell us that what is there inside the neutron star. So I will wait for you uh, people to tell me. Okay. Now, uh, so what about elements? We, uh, I said a few times that when a st uh, star forms, it has hydrogen and helium. Then you get nuclear fusion, you get uh, the carbon and if massive stars you get from nuclear fusion oxygen and silicon and iron and the more heavier the nucleus become it takes more initial energy to fuse so after iron you cannot fuse so what happens uh, when a star collapses means uh, nuclear f uh, as i said that when nuclear fusion stops it keeps on emitting and there is no nuclear fusion stopped means no production of heat, it is cooling down and then supernova happens, right? So, uh, you have seen periodic table, right? Full of different elements. Where uh, 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 did all those element, elements came? Because before formation of stars, we had only hydrogen and helium. Then uh, we had stars, we had uh, only up to iron. Then where do all these heavy elements came. So different heavy elements uh, were formed in different astrophysical uh, scenario. And some elements can uh, form in different channels. So I am mostly impor, uh, interested in elements which are orange, so like actinium or polonium, those are fully orange. And you see, means those color codes are different formation channel. Like those greens are during supernova explosion, and or <coughs> just one minute. Those orange thing. Oh, I pressed something. So those orange is merging neutron star. So if there are two neutron star. And somehow you can merge them, how you can that I will tell you, because uh, then there are production of all this uh, heavy element. Interestingly, you see that this AU, you know that is uh, gold, right? Uh, the gold is mostly produced in merging neutron star and sometimes it can form during formation of white dwarf. So is not it interesting next time when you wear a gold earring or gold necklace think that came from merger of two uh, neutron stars. So that uh, makes me very in interested and also not only gold means think of something means all our molecules hydrocarbon they came from uh, stars right. Every moment we are breathing oxygen those oxygen came from a star. So we are children of stars we are stars. Right? So that is why astrophysics is actually knowing ourselves. It's, it is not astrophysics stars are something different. Those are actually we are understanding ourselves. Uh, and now let us talk a little bit about gravity. What is gravity? You know gravity means uh, the attraction of two particles, they attract each other. That Newton told us. It is okay, we can, we have the expression force uh, uh, depends on mass and distance. But then after 100 uh, years or so after Newton came Albert Einstein. He said, sorry Mr. Newton, force is very simplified uh, concept, there is nothing called force. 
it is only geometry so what did einstein say first he said that space and time should be considered together see first when you plot uh, something some graph in your uh, lab notebook you have only x axis and y axis right but if in this hall where is my hand if i want to specify it i have to uh, determine three axis right maybe x axis uh, x, x axis y axis and z axis now earlier my hand was there now my hand is there here right so uh, so now x y z coordinate is different right so if i say x y z and t time then you can specify them right so einstein told okay let us don't distinguish space and time separately we are living in a four dimensional space time and then he devised mathematical theory for uh, this we call a uh, tensor algebra and tensor calculus he used this and then he said okay now instead of force if i have a mass somewhere the space time around it means if there is nothing space time is uh, flat means if it is two dimensions three, three four dimensional or three dimensional flatness is difficult but you can uh, say let us think of two dimension means if there is nothing you have a flat space now if you put a mass space time will be affected by uh, it and uh, we call it curve and that was you will understand from he here so here means it uh, you the, uh, this is a uh, frame and one uh, sheet of rubber is tied here and a heavy mass say, a, 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 on object by iron is placed in the middle so the uh, that sheet uh, before placing that iron ball it was flat right horizontal surface now you have some object so it has curved uh, downward right now you put some uh, there was a ball means some plastic ball so they will just follow the curvature and those plastic balls they will just come to the uh, massive object right so and if your this rubber sheet was invisible you, you would say okay this iron ball just attracted uh, this uh, plastic ball right but actually no uh, iron ball did not attract uh, so it is just the, the sheet was curved so iron ball uh, the plastic ball fell to the iron ball and you can actually do if you give uh, this will happen if you just keep it but if you give some initial velocity of uh, like this direction perpendicular uh, to this object they will rotate it will rotate around uh, this object as so you can actually uh, type in youtube that iron sheet experiment uh, of gravity so you will see there so that is what we say that uh, earth rotates around the sun it is actually sun curved uh, the space time around it and earth is just following the curvature of space time so that is gravity uh, so now consider means in this rubber sheet there is we had uh, axis drawn x and y axis so those axis will also get distorted right so if you it's uh, a uh, measured something say wh when we measured something uh, uh, we had uh, uh, first you had a flat space time right means an uh, undistorted fa uh, fabric so you know uh, some length it was four squares so now the length of four square, uh, squares will be different so length and everything will get changed and that is why means if you sometimes if you put a uh, light it just means so far in this rubber sheet experiment i just said another plastic ball but not only plastic ball even light follows the curved path follows the curvature so means in our school textbook we say that light travels in a straight line right but if there is a very massive object a uh, light follows a curved path but that we cannot visualize sometimes we say oh okay say so if light coming from this direction and following a curved path like this and say oh light is coming from this direction and that phenomena we call bending of light it is actually light is not getting bending like uh, space time is bended and light is following different path so that is a bending as of and this this is another view of its uh, orbit there there is a massive object uh, space time is curved around it and another object is orbiting around this now so for all these pictures 
awkward just to make you, uh, uh, it is easier for you to visualize, but actually it is a 3D, space is three dimensional and then there is time. Time we cannot visualize anyway, we uh, cannot help it. But let us try to view at least distortion of three dimensional space. Let us start means, see the, if the object means is a corner of two rubber sheet like things, so it is distorting both uh, that uh, thing uh, below and one side, right? I have drawn it only two sides. Now it it has uh, it's everywhere. So it is actually the distortion is like that. Means in two dimensional you have only one surface you make your grid and here you have grid everywhere uh, uh, around the object. And yes, if the object was not here means the grid would be uh, this large is like this, this undistorted region and when the object is there, this part is distorted. So uh, the, that is actually Einstein's concept of gravity and when the mass is small or mass is large but takes a large uh, space means low density, they are these things gives the result which is the same as what uh, say Newton's theory predicts. So that is why uh, for so far we said Newton was right. But you, when you have object, very dense object like neutron star or black hole, you will see some observable uh, phenomena which cannot be explained through Newton's theory. So that is why general relativity comes and we can do lots of tests of general relativity using neutron stars and black hole. But to do all this you need to see neutron star. How do we see neutron star? Because I said uh, there is no more uh, nuclear fusion, right? Nuclear fusion stopped long ago, it become cold, then it collapsed. But there are a few things. First, it, it had uh, some residual heat. Means before it become absolute zero temperature, gravity on and uh, it be, uh, become a neutron star, but that residual heat, it emits. And there are some other uh, magnetic phenomena. But the most interesting is comes here. So a neutron star, we say that strong magnet, right? And probably you know uh, then that Earth is also a magnet. And for each magnet, you have a North Pole and South Pole, right? For Earth, you know the magnetic North Pole is not the geographic North Pole, right? It is little bit tilted. And for neutron star also, it can happen, right? Nobody said that. Uh, it's a, it's a ma uh, magnet inside you can consider there is a bar magnet inside the neutron star. The, you know, it can happen that bo both its uh, spin axis and new, uh, magnetic axis are aligned, but uh, that is not necessity, right? Nothing forbids that uh, you have a spin axis and magnetic axis to be misaligned. So if uh, I need to, uh, within 10 minutes I need to finish I think. So if they are misaligned, then what happens means there is a theory in uh, say MSC electrodynamical theory that if a magnet rotates, it emits electromagnetic uh, radiation. So in neutron star, you have a magnet which is misaligned with the spin axis. So when the neutron star is spinning, the magnet is also spinning around its axis, right? And it is emitting torch light beam uh, from its north pole and south pole. So we can see that beam. And that uh, is I interesting. See, if it was sun-like uh, 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 spherical emission from every direction, we could see it. Whenever it is in the sky, it, uh, we could see. But now it is narrow beam uh, only through North Pole and uh, South Pole, like, just like the pointer. So see, uh, pro, uh, think uh, maybe this door is our Earth. Everyone can see that door. Okay, now probably from there it is difficult. So you see, this is actually this uh, little girl. She was a PhD student who discovered the first neutron star. So let us think she is up, and my this pointer is a uh, 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 neutron star. So it uh, it is emitting beam. So it it is rotating. See, uh, if the beam is pointing to Earth, so after one rotation, it falls on Earth. Then uh, as it is rotating, it shifts. After one full rotation, it falls on uh, Earth again. So once in, uh, uh, in one uh, spin period, we see it. So for us, we don't see anything else. We just see some sudden uh, light 
and then we don't see. After some time, we see. So first, when it was discovered, they thought uh, it is pulsing, just emitting, uh, getting switched up, emitting switched up. Th that is why they call this type of neutron star pulsar. But it is actually, uh, say, uh, the beam is just shifting from, from us. But as, as, as it, it does not mean we can see all the pulsar, right? Here my beam is pointing to earth. But it can be that this is still the earth, but I have another neutron star which is pointed to other direction, right? So we we have discovered more than 3,000 pulsars, but there are many more pulsars in our galaxy. We cannot see them because they are uh, uh, so beaming to other direction. So uh, as I said that we know more than 3,000 pulsars, and most of them are isolated. They are, are some they are in binary system means one neutron star and some other star th that can be uh, something else. They are orbiting around each other and those stars we call binary star. They are very interesting because they help us to understand gravity. So I will tell you wh what but before that means neutron stars are very bright means no, not in optical means this pulsed emission that is very strong in uh, radio wavelength. So you need radio detector to see, uh, see them. So radio detector like you have dish antenna for your television, you need a big dish antenna. So those are the few interesting dish antenna. Those two are in the US. This is near Pune or Indian. They, it is actually not very big, but they have 30 antenna. And this is actually top of the Uti mountain. So you, if you get an opportunity next time you go for, uh, to Uti for tourism, just go to Uti observatory, you will see this telescope. So with that, uh, so, so what we can uh, measure? First, uh, see when uh, a pulse is coming, after uh, then next pulse is coming. So you can get the period, right, rotational period of the pulsar. And you will see that uh, the, the rotational period is increasing with time. Why? Because the, the, the star, it is emitting radiation, right? It is losing energy. So when, uh, to rotate it, it needs kinetic energy. So its kinetic energy is being emitted in the form of this electromagnetic energy. So you, it has some speed period. And if you do some physics, you will see the magnetic field uh, so because this emission mechanism depends on magnetic field, right? Because I say that rotating magnet is the reason. You see that uh, magnetic field depends on square root of spin period and rate of change of spin period. That is how we measure spin period. Means we just see the signal, we measure spin period and spin period derivative, then we can uh, the same magnetic field. Because we cannot go near a neutron star and measure the magnetic field because they are right. So th that is one thing. Another uh, thing means all those effects of general relativity which uh, is evident uh, so for binary pulsar, you can measure those effects and those magnitude of those effects depend on masses of the neutron star. So that is why I, we measure their masses. Means we cannot go and measure the mass uh, in a uh, Owen scale, right? We just uh, detect the general relativistic effect and we uh, measure them and we say. So one thing is that precision of the, the orbit. See, uh, if it was Newton's theory, so you have a massive object, say sun, you have earth. Earth is orbiting around the sun, right? It will keep, uh, it is keeping uh, like this. But uh, the, the Newton's theory predicts that. But because of general relativity, predicts that, okay, but the orbit first, it was like this. But then it will start in the same plane, uh, it will rotate. Means then it is like this. It is like this. Then it is like this. So this has been me uh, measured. And that I actually tried to demonstrate you. Let me just, uh, 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 although. So th this is one ellipse, right? In the flat space, I have drawn one ellipse. So one object, say massive object, uh, is here in the one of the focus of the ellipse. And then means in the ellipse, uh, uh, another star uh, is orbiting. So this is a flat Newtonian theory. Now this object which is in the focus, 
which is very massive. So it is be, uh, bend, uh, uh, it has bended, right? So now you, you see if, uh, it will be distorted. So uh, the other object will not, ellipse will not be closed. It will start processing. There is another effect, uh, only two minutes. Huh? Another effect, orbit total decay. Means Einstein theory predicts that when two objects orbits around each other, it emits a kind of wave called gravitational waves. And like electromagnetic waves, gravitational waves also carry energy. And that energy comes at the cost of, cost of orbital kinetic energy. So uh, because of that, the uh, uh, orbit, orbit sinks and those two objects, they come close together, close together and they merge. So if you have initially two neutron star, two neutron star will merge, you get gold and a big burst of gravitational wave and we pulsar people can measure that rate of change of orbital period. Like in Sun Earth system, the orbital period is one year, right, 365 days. Uh, this decay is almost zero, means uh, it, it is always 365, but in case of binary pulsar, uh, we can me measure this, this uh, rate of change of orbital period is significant, we measure that, that is another GR effect we measure and uh, actually when first this effect was measured in 1975, uh, say those people uh, got the Nobel Prize in 93, so, uh, so th that's it and another thing we can uh, do with pulsar means, uh, you, you know, uh, means there are many galaxies, right? Each galaxy contains lots of stars. Uh, and means like stars can be in bi binary orbit, there are many galaxies, they are or, or in binary, it means two galaxies orbiting around each other. They also emit gravitational wave. And we can use pulsar to detect the gravitational waves coming from those mar merger of galaxies. And that is one experiment we call pulsar timing array experiments. We are currently four group. We are doing this experiment. Uh, so we are trying for, uh, to detect, but you need very sensitive technique. So we have not done it. Hopefully within next five years, we will do it. So I'll stop here today and I'll say uh, lots of uh, interesting pulsar results are done by PhD student, including first discovery by Jocelyn Bell, PhD student whose photo I showed you. So I'll stop here. Okay. Thank you for the wonderful talk, Professor. Now, questions are open for the participants. Please raise your hand. Good morning, madam. Uh, yes. I am Harsha Vardhan oh. and uh, I hail from KVIT and uh, I have a uh, question. Mm -hmm. So, I really loved your lecture. Thank you. But then, uh, I have a really intriguing question uh -huh. about black holes. Okay. So, this is a question. So, how can a Schwarzschild radius of a black hole be related to its surface area of its event horizon? Yes. So, that is uh, uh, a bit difficult to explain without means, mathematics but I will still try. Uh, see, by, by black holes means when we think about black hole, we don't know wha what it is happening. We only know uh, state of matter. We only know its gravity is very high, right? And by source cell radius is actually the, uh, the radius means if you go closer to the, uh, that, this light cannot uh, come. And to do it means uh, you have to do uh, all the mathematics. You will see, means be, it depends on, uh, obviously it should depend on, on mass, right? Before short cell radius, uh, the light cannot come. After short cell radius, gravity cannot, uh, the light can come. So. Uh, first you say that you agree that the value of the source cell's radius will be larger if mass is larger, right? So, uh, the, uh, and that actually matches with our calculation means source cell radius is 
uh, uh, related to uh, uh, mass and you multiply by gravitational constant g and c square so the, this this is uh, the very uh, uh, like a toy uh, example means in principle you have to do all the thing means you can say before source cell radius uh, space time is more curved and then it is less curved so uh, depending upon mass the curve where the curvature is stronger that uh, depends on mass right so that is how the source cell radius depends on the mass well my question was how does short cell radius depend on the surface area of the its event horizon uh, okay so I say uh, it does not depend on a uh, surface area of the uh, event horizon so now what we uh, you call uh, uh, the event horizon means even uh, in some it again depends on means see short cell radius it assumes that a black hole is non spinning so when the black hole is sp spinning that time there is no more short cell radius there is some limiting thing which we call event horizon so for non spinning uh, thing it uh, non spinning black hole short cell radius and event horizon uh, are the same but uh, but for spinning black hole uh, means we cannot specify where something equivalent to short cell radius is there uh, so we call event horizon is something uh, so before which light cannot come right and uh, uh, so after that there is something means light cannot come at the event horizon and particle cannot uh, there is another uh, 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 limit another radius before event horizon particle can, uh, see like a particle can orbit a black hole right but it cannot uh, you will say okay maybe can it orbit in the event horizon light can do but particle cannot be uh, there is another limit so did um, it so my primary assumption was the black hole was stationary uh, uh, yeah you know yeah so uh, for well uh, you should call it uh, static so in terms of physics the uh, stationary and static we use in different terms one is rotation and one is motion so yeah if black hole uh, does not rotate then so cell radius and event horizon become the same thank you madam the other question sam mm -hmm. so uh, my name is anirudh and i am from pa senior in mailapur huh. so my question is uh, space i mean ma mass bend space time yes so according to this everything should follow spiral path and collapse into the uh, mass which is greater like our uh -huh. sun bends the according to the iron sheet the balls finally hit that uh, iron uh, matter so like that shouldn't the planets go and collapse with the stars but in cases like for mars the phobos will fa fall into it eventually and crash but for our moon it is moving apart from us uh, time and time so why does it change for particle to particle because even though the mass changes the if the mass increases the amount of space time bent increases and the gravitational force also increases if the mass decreases space time bent is decrease yeah. and the ma gravity decreases so with respect to mass we can't say anything about it but are there uh, any other reason okay no uh, the, so let me uh, the, uh, you are saying how uh, the planets are orbiting around sun why they are not collapsing to sun right uh, collapsing and also why some planets collapse some collapse and why others don't uh, 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 yeah no uh, no planet is uh, collapsing not collapse. planet moons like uh, phobos will fall into the mars uh, eventually uh, 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 yes so that depends uh, 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 probably you uh, miss that when i said that rubber sheet experiment means if you just keep the ping pong ball it will fall to the other object but if you give a initial tangential velocity it will uh, keep on moving so because see when uh, again uh, you can think uh, uh, of uh, gravity or uh, means first let us think in terms of force so uh forget the uh, curvature right so you will see how the sun is attracting earth why earth is not for falling to uh, uh, the sun because uh, see force is equal means the same force earth is giving to sun sun is uh, giving to earth but earth is lighter so earth should fall low too but as means initially when earth was formed means here is my oh, and just let me 
so this is sun this is earth if initially they were just stationary earth would fall but initially earth started with uh, a tangential uh, velocity and uh, so if there was no gravity it would just pass by right but because there uh, was gravity it just started to bend and uh, it is orbiting so centrifugal force and gravity is ba balancing now it is uh, now you replace gravitational force by curvature so the curvature uh, because of curvature the uh, uh, object say here earth is trying to come to earth but your centrifugal force initial motion that is trying to overcome that, uh, that so that centrifugal force is still there so and if that centrifugal force is not enough then gravity is winning slowly slowly so uh, it can uh, initially in spiral and initially it can come or in, st uh, in case of a neutron star neutron star object uh, they, are, they are losing this it's uh, becoming closer by emitting of gravitational waves so if any other force disturbs the I mean like uh, movement of the planets around the sun then they would either collapse or move free I mean like break apart from the sun's gravitational field right uh, uh, that depends on uh, how uh, means how your this disruption happened because when the disruption happened if it was initially direction of out outward it can happen so usually for binary means our stars it it happens means it's binary stars they can break apart or they, uh, it depends upon initial distance between the two objects in uh, the binary system and wh when the departure happen means the other object means whether say uh, you have the sun and earth something else came and it pushed the uh, sun towards this direction so it will but it can push the sun toward uh, earth toward this direction or to this direction then it will it depends upon the disruption uh, scenario process okay thank you okay so uh, it has you all have to talk when it is your turn okay so um, are you learning algebra and uh, this is uh, we have professor v ravindran who's a director of our institute he's a um, theoretical physics uh, scientist okay so you all learn algebra don't you and geometry have you heard of algebraic geometry yes okay so we have a scientist who works on algebraic geometry and i would like to start with uh, professor uh, jaya ayer i would like her to share uh, with us what she is working on hello is it uh, okay right? yeah okay so algebraic geometry so as uh, uh, bb mentioned so it involves algebra and geometry so geometry as such actually i think if you la start uh, looking at pythagoras theorem and so on so you would have studied uh, triangles and other kinds of shapes circle and so on and uh, so that involves uh, your scale and uh, uh, compass and uh, you would draw figures and try to understand the angles and so on so this is the what is the understanding of geometry that we have in our initial years of study uh, maybe in school and uh, but actually if you advance further so then actually you would uh, want to look at shapes which are not just uh, drawn using a scale and compass but you would also look at shapes which you can try to visualize in three dimensions for example a sphere or maybe a cylinder or maybe a torus your donut and so on so this is some uh, uh, some shapes sitting inside your uh, three dimensional space but now if you can uh, because if you want to have some glimpse of physics because many people have said that physics is just applied maths i'm not going to contest it because there are many uh, 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 physicists here so that's not the point of discussion but basically so they would like to look at uh, uh, shapes in uh, higher dimensions and where you can think of your time and uh, velocity as another uh, 
dimension and uh, so you would actually like to look at the interrelations between uh, objects in uh, uh, in various forms in higher dimensions so this is what uh, prompted mathematicians to look for abstract shapes in higher dimensions and uh, then one would like to understand what it is actually like how do you study all these objects so it so happens that the simplest uh, shapes one would like to look at in higher dimensions come from zero set of polynomial equations so this is what is uh, algebraic geometry about say for example if you just take a single polynomial uh, and look at it uh, say in one variable so that so the zero set consists of only a finite set of points but now if you look at a polynomial in two variables so then if you look at its zero set so this is going to give you a curve inside r2 and then you would like to understand the shape of that actually like how does it is it sharp at some points or is it is uh, very nice and uh, no sharp corners and uh, so that involves the study of that polynomial which defines the zero set so this is where algebra comes into the picture and uh, so now actually you can generalize this and look at uh, not just a polynomial in one or two variables but in several variables and not just a single polynomial but several polynomials say finitely many of them and take the common solutions for a finite set of such polynomials so that gives rise to some shapes inside higher dimensional uh, spaces which we call them as euclidean spaces and try to understand the shapes of them so that is where uh, uh, the interplay between algebra and geometry comes about actually so i think i don't want to bombard with many uh, high tech words but uh, but this i hope gives some fair idea of what algebra algebraic geometry uh, is about thank you thank you ma'am I'm sure you all will be having lot of questions. We will save it for, for the last. And now, um, so what do you do with your computers? I'm sure you all have your computer smartphones. What do you do with it? Maybe I'll give you options. A. Netflix. B. Online classes. C. Um, what do you uh, C. Curiosity. You search things and find out uh, answers for your questions. D. More. Netflix, Prime, Hotstar, everything. So, which is it? C, D. Okay, I can hear some Ds and E. C. Who is C? Can I can I see those uh, people who option for whom options are C? Oh my God. Okay. So yeah. So but uh, we have somebody who does um, uh, bigger things with computer. Like uh, we have a computer scientist here. Her name is uh, Professor Sushmita Gupta. I try to read her uh, uh, publications. All I found catchy was rainbow matching. What is rainbow matching? She makes theories. Shall we hear from her? Sushmita. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Sorry, I was a little late. I got uh, caught up in traffic jam. Um, so. I work in this topic called uh, theoretical computer science. So what is theoretical computer science would require us to just peel back what we understand computers as. So if I look at a computer, it be a desktop or a laptop or uh, any of your smart gadgets and so on, what we basically see is basically a tangible object, right? And you press some buttons that starts up some application or a software and then you get some desired results out of it, right? So obviously there are two things happening here. One is the hardware that we can all touch and see, the software which we can perceive because, you know, I press a button and something happens on the screen, right? And the things that we don't see are how these two things are interfacing. Like how is it that I press a button on the screen and something actually goes, something clever, intelligent, smart happens in the processing unit of your gadget and then I get the desired result. Also the other question is why is it the gadgets are designed in a way that this is the way they work, right? The gadgets usually store some data, some information, they have some storage space and they do some kind of computation as 
we press the buttons and uh, run our applications or software. So these things, the things that we don't see, are captured by mathematics, abstract math that uh, we don't, uh, we are not able to touch or perceive, but they are actually working, and that's what makes the whole thing sort of uh, run. That's where theoretical computer science is. That's where it lies. That's what it is. I specifically work in algorithms. So, what are algorithms? I'm sure you know what are algorithms. Can somebody say what is an algorithm? Somebody said a set of instructions, right? Who was it? Yeah, set of instructions to do what? To do any work or some. Right, that's exactly what an algorithm is. And a recipe to make tea is also an algorithm, right? You have some input, you follow some instruction, like step by step, and at the end you get an output, right? Which is like the tea. So that's exactly what an algorithm is. Now, how we did what an algorithm should do? Well, that might be very task specific. I want this work to be done. So this algorithm should do this and so on and so forth. So that's where the research in algorithm lies. You use all sorts of ideas, maths. Sometimes you can be inspired by other things like the phenomena that are happening in nature and so on and so forth. And you try to design a set of instructions so that a final ultimate. What was that? Interesting interlude. <laughs> Very interesting. Okay. All right. Um, right. So, um, so now, uh, I'll, so as you can see, we were talking about some gadgets. So the gadgets have finite space, memory space. You also want, don't want to wait your entire lifetime to complete a task, right? You want things to happen really fast. And if you have used uh, computers, uh, like, uh, like in the last 20, 25 years that I have been using computer, the power, computing power and devices have just rapidly increased, right? So things, computations happen really fast. Uh, so these are the sort of things that, so just having an algorithm, just a step by step, in, which eventually will give you a result, is not really realistic, practical, or desirable. Right? We agree on that, right? We want things to happen really fast. And also, you want to have cheaper and cheaper devices which can do things faster, right? Nobody wants to spend a lot of money to buy a really fancy gadget. I mean, some people may be able to do it, but most of us just want something that is affordable, right? So, there's that cost aspect. So, all these things are what we consider resources. And we want to design algorithms which can be run faster, take less storage, take less sort of, you know, the device manufacturing should be cheap, and so on and so forth. So this is where efficiency of algorithms comes about. So our goal is to design more and more efficient algorithms to perform host of tasks. So she mentioned something about rainbow matching. So that rainbow matching is one of these problems which captures some phenomena, some natural aspect, uh, and sort of tr studies this, that question in a sort of a mathematical way. Okay. So does anybody know what is a matching? Like, what is a matching? You can answer. complementary to each other okay so let's take you did remember when we were kids we were given match the following like you would have a column one stuff uh, some things listed and another column where a bunch of other things I have a really young son he's not yet five he loves these types of questions and you have to like match column uh, items in column A to column B right so when somebody says matching that's literally the first thing that comes to mind so matching is kind of like that only where you have bunch of objects on uh, Think about it as two-sided thing on one side and a bunch of other objects on the other side and you're trying to match them in a way that is most relevant. Okay? So where is matching used in real life? Loudly? So which grades are you all in? Are you all, all of you are high school students, right? Oh good. So you will be entering the, I mean, you're just on the cusp of sitting for these entrance exams and getting admissions into colleges, right? So can't you relate matching to that? 
so you have a desire for getting to certain colleges certain branches and so on right those colleges don't have unlimited seat they can't admit all of you right so they have some upper capacity and they will take some students that are sort of compatible with what they want and so on and so forth so this is a very simple example of a matching there's a college admissions problem so you have a list of colleges you want to get in okay let's take the entrance exam model okay so you write an entrance exam you get a rank right and those ranks are basically a ranking of the students of the incoming students that the universe the, the colleges and all they agree upon so the fir the first rank holder like all india rank 1 th that person will get admission into any college of their choice any department any uh, discipline of their choice right the second person gets whatever is available their choice among whatever is available and so on so what is happening here is basically a matching students are being matched to the available college seats right you can think the same thing happens in the job market also there are a bunch of people who are interested in jobs uh, there are employees uh, employers who have uh, job openings and they are trying to find the most compatible uh, matches right that's where you are the, somebody said compatible matches that's where that comes in not everybody is suitable for every job because there are skill sets involved their experiences required and so on and so forth not every individual wants to get any job that is available right they have their own interest desires and expectations and so on and so forth so this is where the compatibility comes in right so if you think around if you look around you'll find huge number of applications of matchings okay so so this is the sort of this is what is matching even in maths like we model this in terms of graphs you have vertices vertices are these points representing the agents or the objects that want to be matched edges are well this can this individual can be matched to this thing this job let's say okay so that edge is basically a connection representing that and you want to find a matching now is finding any matching enough no you want to find maybe the largest matching well you want to find largest matching why because you want to match as many people to as many jobs as possible you don't want to have any waste right uh, just finding the largest matching may not be suitable again because again you have these people's expected uh, preferences job openings have their own requirements and individuals vying for jobs also have their preferences so you want to create a matching that is sort of suitable for both sides so that's where you get uh, matchings under preferences so matching itself has many different refinements so um, rainbow matching is one such example where you have the same question of find me a matching except that now the edges that we are talking about the connections between individuals and the uh, you know let's say job openings they also come with some colors associated what are those colors i'll just tell you and now the goal is to find a matching where no color is represented more than once so that's where the rainbow thing comes in it's like a multicolored matching okay so what can these colors represent in real world why am i putting these colors on these edges and asking find me a matching where um, no color is represented more than once what kind of functions give me an example sure so that is basically captured in matching a classical matching would say like no two points let the end point you se select a set of edges or this matches so that no individual get match match to more than one job which is what you are saying one can only go to one job and no job opening is matched to more than one person because you know one job opening can only be held by you know can only employ one person so that's part of the definition of matching but i'm glad you brought that up okay so that's basically a, a set so what matching captures the colors that i'm adding could be seen as something like um, you know duplication like i want certain be i want certain jobs to be like this association individuals to jobs they're representing a type let's say and i only want exactly one item of a certain type i don't want two items of two type two matches of the same type so that's what a color could represent okay so this sort of a thing 
these kinds of ref additional refer you can have matchings with ca capacities like colleges will have a lower capacity and an upper capacity right they are not going to start a department or a degree program with one student they want a certain number of students for them to even make sense to hold classes and so on so that's like the lower capacity they also cannot uh, you know, um, uh, admit all students, anybody who's interested in it. So they have an upper capacity. So sometimes you have matching that require you to satisfy those lower and upper capacities and so on. So this is one, I'm glad you brought up the issue of matching because that is a good example of the type of work I do. I do work a lot on matching and its refinements. It's a very fundamental question in maths. Uh, computer science, combinatorics, huge amount of research has happened for decades um, studying this problem. It has obvious economic re uh, relevancy, uh, financial implications and so on. So we, there are lots of different types of scientists who study matching for using the expertise, whatever their, their uh, you know, uh, area of study is. So if any of you, all of you, uh, anybody you know is interested in maths and computer science um, and really enjoys solving math problems, thinking about math problems, I really encourage you to keep in mind this subject called theoretical computer science, which unfortunately you would not be hearing about until you are in college, right? That's the difficulty. This is that you know something about physics, chemistry and so on and so forth by the time you are in high school but this is a subject that is taught only in colleges so but now you know what that is you can read up about it uh, you all say that you do uh, google you search google for information and uh, things of curiosity and so on so there are lots of um, uh, videos and lectures on what are algorithms what is algorithm design and so on and i really encourage you to have a look at it so if i see any of you in the future and that would be very, very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sushmita. Thank you, Professor Sushmita. That was uh, very interesting. And um, we have uh, two high energy particle physicists among us Professor V. Ravindran and Professor uh, Sri Hari Gobalakrishna. Do you uh, want to hear about what is high energy physics? Yeah, so I uh, request Professor V. Ravindran to start. So my profession is actually to, uh, you know, to do research here, research in uh, theoretical physics. Physics, of course, all of you know, theoretical physics is actually a, you know, one half of the physics. Okay, what is the other half? Sorry. Astronomical physics. Anything else? So there are a lot of you know areas in physics, like you know studying physics of light, you know physics of um, stars and planets. Okay, it's called astrophysics. Huh? And then what else? Physics of sound. Okay, physics of moving objects, physics of planets. You know how these things happen actually. You know to understand the phenomena that you see in nature, even things that you don't see, okay? Like, you know, things that happens in stars, you cannot see directly, okay? But you observe something and actually see. So there are a lot of branches of physics that we do, but you know, every branch, if you look at, there are, there is a clear division, which we call, you know, theoretical physics and experimental physics. So if you take any physics, most of the physics branches, there are two main parts actually. One is experimental, other one is theoretical. This is for convenience actually, because in those days people did you know, both experiments as well as theories. You know, if you ask Newton whether he's an experimentalist or a theorist, he, he would not understand, because that time people are doing experiments and try to understand that and write theories for that actually. Now we don't have time to do both actually. Okay, there are people who do who are more uh, energetic, but now it's divided. So in our institute, all the fa faculty working in physics, they all work in uh, theoretical physics. I also work in theoretical physics. My uh, area of interest is actually strong interaction physics. So what are the type of interaction that we have in nature? There are four types of interactions. 
gravity, strong interaction, weak interaction, electromagnetic interaction. So these are the four interactions. My area of interest is strong interaction physics, studying, uh, you know, the smallest uh, of uh, thing that you can actually imagine, like quarks and gluons, how they interact, how a nucleus is formed, why everything is stable in nature, okay, what is the interaction between them. You must have heard quarks and gluons, okay. So, we, I study uh, the nature of the interactions and things like even though I don't do experiments, but there is, there are many experiments that are being conducted, you know, in, in all over the world actually, to really provide information about the experimental observations. For example, somebody gives you a plot of something between two things. What theorists do is actually try to understand from whatever laws that we know, okay, try to actually understand, try to build some models to explain these actually. And models have to be not too many actually, only, you know, few. Otherwise, you know, it's like you cannot fit every event by a model and say that I'm doing a theoretical physics. So you, what you need to do actually have a kind of a simple looking, you know, unified models to try to explain various phenomena in single framework actually. So my area of interest is strong interaction physics. In addition, I also work on something called Higgs boson. How many of you heard about Higgs boson? Okay. So what is the relevance of Higgs boson actually? Why is it so popular, you know, for last, uh, let's say, one decade or so? Yeah. No, not really. Yeah. So, actually, physicists, you know, often ask questions. Because if they see a phenomena, the first thing that they ask, why is it happening, actually, right? Otherwise, if you don't ask and just let it go, then, uh, then that's it, okay? So, of scientists, what do they do? They ask questions. Why this happens? Do you understand, you know, the underlying reason behind it? Can you put it in a framework and apply to something and which can actually become a, you know, an application to that? And uh, that is what we do, right? So, one of the questions that people were pondering about is actually how, you know, this elementary particles acquire mass actually. You know elementary particles. You heard about elementary particles? What are those elementary particles? In Q1 name, uh, oh, sorry? Fermions. Just name one of the fermions. Le leptons is just a generic name for, for you know, muons. Electrons. You have forgotten electrons. Okay? Electrons, neutrinos, neutrinos come with different types. So these are called elementary particles. Elementary because they are the building blocks of all of us actually. All of us are made up of, you know, such elementary particles, quarks, gluons, electrons, photons, muons. You know, all these particles constitute, not that we are all made up of muons, but you know, we are made up of quarks and gluons and electrons. Okay, so particularly, you know, particles, not antiparticles, okay? So, and if you ask the question, okay, you can actually measure the mass of the proton, mass of U, okay? And you can start asking, what is the mass of U? You will say a few kilograms. Then I ask, actually, you, somebody said, you know, you are made of, made up of cells, okay? What is the mass of a cell? That's a question one can ask, actually. Then you can ask, what is the constituents of cell? Then you can say cell has, you know, many things, proteins, this and that, actually chromosomes. Then you ask the question, what is the mass of this, you know, chromosomes. So you can start probing for, you know, one after the other. And you can start explaining why each one of them is, you know, this much of kilogram, this much of gram, this much of milligram, this much of, you know, milli milligram or whatever, you know, unit that you use, you can keep on actually probing. Now you'll reach a stage like, you know, if you ask what is the mass of an electron, you can give some number. What is the mass of a muon? You can give some number. Mass of a quark. Now, if you ask the question, what is the ma how they acquire? What, why is that mass? For example, if you say if there somebody is made up of, you know, one million, you know, some cells, and if you know mass of one cell, one billion cells, we know mass of one 
cell, you can just add and get a mass, okay, total mass actually. But if a lepton or you know, any one of the leptons, any one of the quarks, which has a mass, you know, very small, let's say some number. Hmm? Then if you ask the question, what is the mass, how it gets, it cannot be divided, right? Because the elementary, that is not indiv indivisible actually. Okay, that's not in the divisible. If it is not divisible, you cannot explain the mass of the particle, right? Isn't it? If I want to ask mass of, you know, people sitting here, you just add sum them all, right? But if you ask mass of an object which is indivisible, okay, then you cannot, that's where our, you know, answer stops. So you'll have to really understand where the mass of this elementary particle comes from. The answer is actually the X boson. So you will have to study X physics and things like that. Yeah. Sir, uh, but uh, Paul Dirac actually uh, did some work and proved that uh, uh, it is the uh, energy from vacuum is taken to form ma particles, no, sir? Energy is taken from? Uh, uh, energy is energy is taken from uh, uh, vacuum uh, and then uh, for momentarily it forms uh, a particle of some mass and then an uh, equivalent antimatter is also formed and then again the energy is given back to vacuum that's how the particle the that what you are talking about is like you know in vacuum you can create a particle and antiparticle and then they can get annihilated actually but you cannot create energy out of nothing you cannot destroy energy to nothing because energy is conserved quantity right yes. so in if you see vacuum vacuum when we say vacuum uh, in classical physics vacuum means nothing actually but uh, in quantum world in quantum physics there is not vacuum doesn't mean that actually it's completely empty but there are a lot of activities happening namely you know from nowhere you can produce electron positron pairs they live for some time and then they get annihilated to vacuum back actually. I was saying that only sir. So it does answer your question on how... This uh, doesn't answer the question of how elementary particles which are indivisible acquire mass. The answer comes from a gentleman or you know, a few of the physicists who worked on it and gave an answer. It's, it, comes, it is called the Higgs mechanism and this mechanism also provided uh, you know that that there ex should exist a particle called Higgs boson and uh, this explanation was actually verified in a laboratory called CERN okay so what we study is actually to you know basically to ask questions like this that why you know something has this particular value why this happens actually so in our institute some of us study you know such questions and try to answer we answer these questions from the you know results available from the experiments. Physics cannot be done without, you know, having seen, you know, the data coming from the experiments. You cannot sit at, you know, and I can calculate something and you can claim that that is actually nature. Nature, we, you know, propose theories, we understand the phenomena, okay, only based on the observations actually. Okay, there are few examples where people had actually extrapolated it and predicted not just simply based on the experiments for example when Einstein actually proposed uh, you know general theory of relativity there were things that actually it was not known but he predicted actually okay so everything is actually based on experiments and uh, as a theoretical physicist what we do is actually we look at you know the observations made by the experimentalist and try to understand use mathematics and certain laws that we actually developed in over you know centuries okay and apply them and uh, try to explain that actually so we ask questions we look you know look at the observations and make theories using mathematics and also predict and check whether our theories are correct or not in the same laboratories or similar laboratories so uh, our institute most of us work on you know such phenomena actually. Some of them work on physics which are happening at a very high uh, energy regions. Some of this one that uh, Manjari discussed today, she talked about, uh, I think about large scale structures like, you know, what's happening at uh, far distances in big, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
it's length scales you know there are length scales which are really really big you cannot imagine and there are length scales which are really really small you cannot think of you know imagining so people do work on you know in this wide range of things and try to understand phenomena that are happening at in this wide range of scales biggest to the smallest ones actually so i work in you know these two areas understanding the strong interaction physics why you know nucleus is bound and things like that to how we all get mass how the elementary uh, particles get mass and if you understand how elementary particles get mass and also some other phenomena we can understand why some of us are 60 kg some of us are 20 kg some of us are you know 100 kg so all these things can be understood if you understand how this fundamental particles acquire mass why that mass is with mass actually okay so that's the kind of thing that we work on actually we use lot of mathematics because we are theoretical physicist but uh, of course uh, we don't do uh, abstract mathematics whatever mathematics that we use is to understand the phenomena actually so that's why we are called physicist okay thank you so if you have questions maybe we can ask later and let uh, other people speak thank you professor veera vindra Professor V Ravindran is the director of the Institute of Mathematical Sciences. I now invite uh, Professor Sri Hari Gopala Krishna to talk uh, on his work. Five minutes. Yes. Five minutes. How long do you want him to speak? No answer. <laughs> no answer. Which means that I'll keep you here for one more hour. Is that fine? Okay, so briefly, what uh, I work on is very similar to what Ravi just uh, talked about. Uh, so the enterprise is the same. We try to understand uh, what are the building blocks of nature and uh, what laws they may obey. And so, why do you think we care about that? Why should we worry about it? Why not just go have some samosa and then call it a day? any any thoughts on why these things are relevant why should we do it yeah understanding more about our world it helps us make more efficient again excellent yeah very practical uh, reason right it will help us build better things we can maybe build better cell phones right better television better cars better everything right if you understand the physics of things or how things behave in the underlying um constituents we are looking at maybe we can put them together in a better way so that's a very uh, useful thing that comes out of this enterprise and sometimes we work on very large time scales today's understanding might lead to a better product 100 years from now right electromagnetism was studied by maxwell way back 1800s and we are reaping the rewards of that now so in that sense it's a very useful enterprise but there is also another very um, you know uh, kind of an important driving force for many of us and i would just say it is curiosity right that too when we see something some of us or many of us especially young people right wonder how things happen what might be going on some curiosity of something right and many of these questions are driven by that kind of a thing also we just want to know as humans we wonder sometimes and when we look up at the sky you know manjari showed you many beautiful pictures and all that sometimes we wonder when we look at the stars you know where are they what are they why are they shining how are they shining many questions come to our mind and we try to understand so in the same spirit many of us try to ask these questions so if you take some material break it up one question you can ask is what might you end up with what is the smallest thing that you will end up with right and so we uh, ravi asked you and many of you answered electrons right that's a very small thing and you can ask uh, what other small things are they all electrons are there other things and we have been constantly doing this for many many uh, decades or centuries and we have now kind of assembled some knowledge of what are all the things that one ends up with you break it and break it and break it at some point you end up not knowing how to break something into smaller pieces right if you are given a hammer and you can only uh, smash things that much with that much force after that your hand gets tired and you cannot break it into any uh, smaller piece 
and you throw up your hands. But somebody will come with a bigger hammer and they will crush it into even better, uh, in, into even smaller pieces. And you can look at the smaller pieces and try to understand what is going on there. And so constantly we have been hammering things and breaking them apart and trying to see what are all the smallest things that you end up with. And so we have a bunch of answers now. An electron is a very tiny thing. And we know today that you cannot break an electron further. Our power runs out. You can ask, can one build a better hammer? And so people are constantly designing better hammers, more powerful hammers, right? These are called accelerators. So we, have you heard of the Large Hadron Collider? Anybody? How many of you have heard of Large Hadron Collider? So in some sense, the LHC, Large Hadron Collider, is a very powerful hammer. It can in fact smash things better than anything else on Earth right now. That's the most powerful hammer that is out there. And so using that, the Higgs boson that Ravi uh, talked about was brought into existence with that hammer. And we studied the Higgs. And now we have a very good understanding of how the Higgs behaves. And we know that, that there is a such, such a particle. We know it is responsible for giving mass, as Ravi talked about, and so on. We have assembled electron, muon, neutrinos, quarks as the building blocks of nature. We also studied how they interact. They interact with the four forces that Ravi talked about, right? Electromagnetic, uh, weak, strong, gravity. They interact through all of these forces. We know all of this. And we understand things to a very fine degree. There are very few puzzles. Is, it, is that all there is? Have we understood everything? Today in the 21st century, the Higgs was discovered when? Anybody knows? Many of you have heard of Higgs. So uh, anybody knows when the Higgs was discovered? Just shout out the answer if you know. No. Any guesses? 2013, somebody said? Just shout out. If you know the answer, shout it out. Shout. 2014? 2012. Who said 2012? Correct answer, 2012. 2013 is also fairly correct, right? Very close. 2014 is also correct, right? But 2012 is when we announced the discovery, right? So uh, it took a while for the Large Hadron Collider to c collect data. And at 2012, scientists became certain that, oh, indeed, we have seen a Higgs. And the Higgs discovery was announced in 2012. And with that, we believe that we have understood the last missing piece of what is called as a standard model. With that, we have kind of completed one picture of nature, of what is relevant in, in what we see and what we cannot see. When you take a hammer, break it up, every small piece that you find, we do understand now, we think, all of those constituents. Is that it? Uh, do we declare victory and then everybody just you know, rice, uh, you know, nicely tapes up everything and then goes home. What do you think? Are we done? If you have kept track of things, do we believe that everything is done? Any thoughts? Is physics all done at this level? Microscopic physics where we study in particle physics, is it all done? No? Somebody said no. Why? Why not no? I told you that we understand very well what is going on. Why do you think no? Perfect. Yeah. Very good driving force. We, how can you say that for sure everything is done, right? We don't know. What if we can build even more powerful hammer and then smash it up and you can smash up an electron, right? Who knows? Perfect answer. So we would like to know. Curiosity. Is that it? No. How do we know? We can never be certain, right? So you keep doing it. And we keep doing the LHC is still running, trying to see if it can smash it up further and try to see, you know, if there is any further constituents. What else? There is a more immediate problem which says that we are not done. What might that be? Huh? Apply, sorry? Ah, application will always be there. That we'll always do. Because we all want to make more money, right? Somebody will come and apply things and try to make more money, right? We want to become rich. 
Application certainly will be true, that we'll keep doing. But from understanding point of view, I'm asking, are we done? We might be wrong, but we say we are fairly sure of what we have assembled right now. We are fairly certain that it is not wrong. We have made a hundred checks. We have made a 500 checks to just because we all suspect that we might be wrong. So we keep checking and we keep checking. And so far we seem to not be making any mistake. We all understand fairly well and there are not any mistakes, we think. So, very good. So, what might those be? I, I'm telling you we understand everything. So, what might we not understand? Maybe natural disasters, natural disasters happen at Earth scale. And I'm talking about elementary particle scale, very, very tiny scale. So, you cannot really hope to bridge the entire gap from tiny particles to natural disaster. We try to do it in physics. has a wide range of applicability because of that. We would wish to understand at many different scales from very tiny particles to also the universe, right? The entire universe. And so that is true, but from I am asking from the elementary point of view, what might be missing? Only one thing is missing? Gravitational part, true. And that is simply because gravity is so weak at the elementary thing that it does not make a difference. It's not like it is missing. It's just that it does not have much effect. We would like to study it, but unfortunately when you go to very tiny masses, gravity becomes very weak. So we don't have the ability to uh, study it. So that's more like it becomes irrelevant at the particle physics scales now. And so perhaps if you go to even higher energies, gravity might kick in. We would like to do it, but right now we cannot do it. There are more immediate problems. We don't understand everything, let me tell you that. And I will also give you a clue from the front row here, somebody said something. Unifying theory is more a theoretical attempt. I'm saying from experimental point of view, what we have measured, we have gaps of understanding. Yeah. Consciousness is an emergent phenomenon which happens at the scale of human brain, right? At this scale. The current thinking is that maybe we'll not be able to understand consciousness in terms of elementary things. It is what is called as an emergent phenomenon, perhaps, right? That's still an open question, but many people believe that. And so, what I'm thinking of is not something so, uh, you know, unknown. It is fairly well known that we do see it, but we don't understand it. Somebody said it here, in, the, in fact. I think you said it, but in a different context. No? Dark matter? You said dark matter, right? Okay. So have people heard of dark matter? How many of you have heard of dark matter? All of you have heard of it. So one puzzle right now is in this standard model that I told you about, we don't have a place for this dark matter. But from looking at the sky, you know, like astronomical and cosmological measurements tell us that dark matter is there. We see its effect. But in particle physics, we don't know what it is. So that's a big hole in our understanding. So many of us try to fill such holes. We try to dream up ways of getting dark matter from some theory. So you extend the standard model in some small way and try to see if we can get the properties required to explain dark matter observations. So that is an enterprise that I am involved in at some level. So unknown things, you know, things that the standard model might be lacking, can we extend it in some way to, f to kind of better understand what we see. And dark matter is one specific example of things that we see, but our theories yet cannot uh, explain. And so that's a classic example. There are certain other things, so I'll just end by mentioning one or two more other puzzles that we still don't have an understanding of. So let me tell you one dramatic thing. One other thing that we don't understand in particle physics is our existence here. Now, what do I mean? What do I mean by our existence here? Have you heard of the Big Bang? Yes, right? Big Bang is this initial very powerful bang that happened, which created our universe. It created all the matter and energy in the universe. And what has hap been happening in the universe is that all of this matter and antimatter has been coming together, right? 
So Big Bang could be thought of as purely starting with energy and somebody very correctly said that you can take energy but you must create matter and antimatter in equal amounts, right? You said that very perfectly. Yeah, you said it. And that was very correct. Because of various conservation laws, laws you have to create an equal number. If you start the universe up as an energy, if you create one matter particle, you better create one antimatter particle, as you correctly said, right? Now, what happened to all the antimatter? What do you think? We are all made up of matter, right? You know that. Are we made up of antimatter also? In some technical sense that Ravi will tell you, the answer is yes, but let's not go to that kind of subtle thing. But at least at the zeroth order level, we are all made up of matter, right? Everybody agrees? Anybody thinks we are made up of antimatter? How do you know your friend sitting next to you might be made up of antimatter, right? Have you checked? Is there a way to check quickly? Yeah? Perfect. That's a very good experimental test to find out if your friend up is made up of antimatter. Did everybody get that? What was the answer? It's just that you touch your friend and if both of you don't annihilate with a big flash of light, which means that both of you are made up of matter, right? Because otherwise, if matter and antimatter come into contact, they will annihilate. They will go into just light. It will just disappear. Both of you will disappear in a flash of light. So the universe has been doing that. If matter and antimatter has been created in equal amounts, they have been coming together and they have been disappearing and they have been going into light. So if that has been constantly happening, the universe is very old, it is 13 billion years old. By now, all of the matter should have come into contact with antimatter and gone away. Then why do we exist, right? That becomes a mystery. And in fact, that is a very central mystery in particle physics today we still don't understand. We think it should have gone away, but yet we find ourselves here and we know we have not gone away. And the question is why? And uh, unfortunately, particle physics cannot answer it now. And many of us also try to think up what might be the reasons why this might be happening. Question? Com coming to the reason of existence, but yeah. we still don't know how real we are from the simulation theory. So, good point. So, I don't mean it in that kind of a very uh, abstract sense. You know, some of us physicists, we are very down to earth people. We want to ex explain things hands on. Put two things together, see what you can do. Things that we can measure, things we can touch with our hands. If we cannot touch with our hands, we should be able to manipulate. We should be able to definitively say what is going on. That's what physics is about. So we want to do definitive, repeatable experiments and then ask questions. What you said might be happening, but how do I know? What is my way of checking all of that? Science doesn't yet have methods of answering that kind of questions. To the extent science can do things today, it is by building a large hadron collider, a big hammer, smashing things together. And we want to be as down to earth and as real as we can before we resort to some things which we cannot actually measure, right? Physics very strongly emphasizes on what is measurable, what is real. So if you say things are not real, then physics will not have very little to say about th those things. Physics wants to deal with real things which can be reproduced in the lab in some way. It may not be directly seeable in our human eyes, but you should be able to at least build a better microscope and see it or something, right? It should be in that But uh, coming in the subject of quantum physics yeah. and quantum mechanics, we know that qu if my understanding is right, quantum physics and string theory go in hand in hand. but apparently so simulation theory has helped in proving a bit of string theory right so yeah so maybe we'll talk later try to uh, catch me or one uh, Ravi or one of us and we'll uh, we'll have a conversation but very quickly experiments right now is at an energy scale if you take the large hadron collider it is smashing protons at 14 tera electron volts and the current understanding of string theory is that strings are not excited at those energies. We need to go to much, much, much higher energies, which we simply lack the ability to go on Earth, right? So you need to have the ability to build a very high energy accelerator if you have to probe string theory in a very direct sense. There might be other more clever ways of probing it, which nobody has thought of yet, 
but you might be able to think of some clever way of doing it. But if you go this traditional route, we just need higher and higher energy accelerators and we are not able to probe string theory yet. But we may be able to probe it in some way in the future. So it is just waiting for such probes. Okay, so I will, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. It is completely fine. It is a matter of definition. If you say you and your friend is made up of antimatter, but your friend can touch the neighbor, the neighbor can touch the neighbor, and so on. So immediately you will conclude all of us must be made of antimatter. And then we are all touching the earth. The earth should be made up of antimatter. Then there is inter, uh, you know, gas, you know, between the earth and moon, right? So that gas is constantly touching. So the whole solar system must be made of antimatter and very quickly the galaxy should be made of antimatter and the observable universe should be made of antimatter. So it becomes a matter of definition. We have just flipped what we call matter and antimatter, right? So you just stick to one definition and you say that it is only made up of that one thing. Yeah, good, good, very good question though. Uh, maybe later because we are getting late. You can also, you know, catch one of us and, uh, you know, ask us later. I just want to end. I don't want to, uh, you know, keep you all for very long. So there are such puzzles. So one is our own existence. It is called the baryon asymmetry. We don't understand why there is a baryon asymmetry in the universe. We don't understand dark matter. And we don't also understand how the neutrinos are getting their mass in particle physics. So these are some of the open puzzles. And therefore, I would argue that we are not done with physics, with particle physics yet. We need to keep going. We need to understand more because, as we said, we are curious, right? We need to know. And this is the enterprise that some of us are involved in. It's a worldwide community, of course, and a few of us in uh, IMSC are involved in this activity. Okay, I'll just end here. Sorry, hope I didn't take too long. Yeah. Thank you, Professor uh, Sridhari. Uh, now, uh, you have heard from all the scientists and uh, I'm sure many of you might be interested or excited to become scientists. We will, uh, you know, of course, you have to do your undergraduation and post-graduation and what after that to become a scientist. We'll hear from uh, two people, uh, Ms. Koina uh, Bose and uh, uh, first from Ms. Koina Bose uh, to do, what do you do to become a scientist? Uh, she's doing PhD here in physics. Uh, we'll hear her from her quickly. I'll be briefing about what I am doing my research in and also the journey because I've been I think seven years elder to you so I think you can relate to the journey or maybe I'll be able to motivate you. So I think um, you've heard about uh, research in uh, high energy right that is systems which are working in really high, uh, uh, high energies but my area of interest is systems which are at really low energy. So you all have heard of electrons, right? So, and you also know uh, Newton's, Newtonian mechanics. All of you have heard about it, I think. So that is for any system. So what does Newtonian mechanics do? Think you have any particle or any point mass. You apply force and you want to know how, what is the trajectory of that particle. That is, think after 10 years, I want to know where that particle is, you can find out. And that is for macroscopic scales. But when you are working with particles, think electrons, you have to apply a different kind of mechanics, which is known as quantum mechanics. And that is what I currently work in. That is six systems which are in microscopic scales and at really, really low energies. That is temperature tending to zero. And why do I do it? What is my motivation to study these kind of systems? So what happens is that think you and your friends decide to go out one day. And one of your friend, uh, he or she gets ready and they come in, they come so well dressed that you can't identify them. You can't, you can't say that that's your friend. So what happens in systems like this, when they are probed at very low temperatures, these systems show emergent properties where you cannot identify that this is exactly an electron. Because what is the most fundamental thing of an electron? When an electron is, what do you think, what is the most fundamental thing? negative charge right minus one charge so for in systems like this which are made up of electrons we can testify that but when they are taken to temperatures which are very close to zero 
and they are probed under high magnetic field, we see that the charges are broken and they become one third, one fifth, two seventh, depending on how much the magnetic field is and what the temperature is. So this is a really interesting system and it has a lot of implications also because if, if these systems are studied well, they can also be used for quantum computations, quantum information. So that is one of the interests and that is my area of research. You can ask more questions about it. But I think I would like to talk about why I am here and how I am here. So around seven years ago, around when I was in school, uh, I was, like many of you, I was interested in science. I was interested by asking questions and to try to know what are the facts behind it, why they occurred and how they occurred. And this has pushed me to take up uh, my major in pure science. I was pretty torn to take up maths or physics, but then let's call it a mix of gut feeling and my parents call that I took up physics eventually, but I realize over time that I really enjoy that subject. And uh, just like many of you who would want to take physics, I also wanted, I was like a budding, budding physics major student with a glee in my eye that, you know, I would become a true scientist and I would unravel all the mysteries of the universe. Many of you are right now. So fast forwarding five years and here I am. Uh, second year PhD student, I've realized few things along the way that, you know, you can't unravel all mysteries of the world, uh, just like the other professors also mentioned. The main idea is to make small contributions, small steps towards the community which actually matters. This is one of the things. Second in thing is that PhD or research is a very long process. You're going to do it for the rest of your life. So what it takes is that the will and the urge to keep asking. And that is something you have to do for the rest of your life. You have to keep, just like Sir said, like you're done, you found Higgs boson, so is the work over? It's not over. You need to keep asking more questions. You need to keep digging deeper. And also, finally, I would end on this note, the hope that, if not all, you can unravel at least few of the mysteries. And I think that's what drives you. Thank you. Any questions? Let's say uh, you are an old person now. Yeah. Years later, and you are about to die. So you look back at your life, you did all, uh, you would have done all of the, all the research, right? And suppose uh, you feel that you haven't made any major contribution to the field of science in general. Will you feel regret or will you feel joy? At least I did something and die peacefully. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this is a really nice question. So this is something that I've pondered over. Like, so um, after my bachelor's, I had to make this call whether I want to uh, pursue with pure science or I want to shift somewhere where I can take a corporate job. Um, that is something a call I had to make. And this is the exact question I had pondered upon that, you know, 50, 60 years down the line, I am working in the same field, doing the same thing every day. I need to enjoy uh, the thing. So. This is where I'll quote something. I'll not say who exactly told me, but I went to one of my professor and I had asked him, uh, you know, are we actually making a lot of contribution to humanity? Are we actually doing something that might, might change the face of uh, humanity? And the answer is no. So all of the research that goes around, maybe few of them will be actually brought to light, which can make a big re uh, revolution, just like Sir said. Maxwell did Maxwell's equation about 100 years ago, which is now getting applied, which is now applications. So researchers don't actually do research with an immediate impact. They do it out of two interests. One is basically they love doing it. You love solving mathematical problems. You're intrigued by the question, why are these emergent properties happening? Why is electron getting split? That is what drives you. Not the fact that I will do this and it will have immediate implications, but the very fact that you just enjoy doing it. And the second thing is, obviously, with the undertone that what you're doing has some meaningful outcome. So answering your question, 60 years down the line, 
if I am on deathbed, I will totally be happy doing what I am doing today because I enjoy it every single day of my life. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Koina. Now I invite uh, uh, Dr. Shirley uh, to speak a few words and what she does. She's, uh, she's doing postdoctoral fellowship here in Computer Science Department. Uh, hello, everyone. So I'm doing uh, postdoc here. Uh, so I have completed my PhD in theoretical computer science. So as Sushmita already introduced you to theoretical computer science, what kind of uh, work you do. So for example, matching. So uh, in matching, like matching also, like there are plenty of problems. Like you have matching other preferences, you have capacity and storage, all of that. But every uh, question, like these kind of question, you cannot cannot answer in any scenario. So for example, she gave some example like uh, this uh, that you have some resource and you have some. Uh, set of people you want to assign these resources to people and these kind of problems like in general setting you may not be able to solve efficiently and efficiently means that you cannot solve them in practically in your lifetime in your entire lifetime if you run a program on a computer it may run forever so for that you uh, what would be the solution what you will do about it so you'll maybe you uh, do different kind uh, take different kind of approaches maybe you uh, just trim uh, like put some restriction on your input so maybe you are saying that okay uh, not in every scenario i can do that uh, but maybe if i have uh, restricted input so uh, like for the same example like you have uh, some resources and you have set of person and you want to assign resources to person so when I make a graphical model out of it, then you have nodes corresponding to resources and people. And you have connections when you know that this person needs this resource. So you, you won't have any connections between the resources, right? You won't have connections between the uh, uh, people, uh, set of people, right? So this gives you a different kind of graph. It is very restricted that you have connections only across two sets. You don't have connections among those sets. So this is a very restricted uh, input. So either you can work on these kind of models where you have restriction on the models itself, on the graphs itself, and you can uh, check, like you can find an efficient solution to it, or maybe even that is not possible sometimes. And in, in fact, most of the times. And uh, then maybe you can talk about some approximation like you want uh, in mathematics what we do we need proofs uh, for everything we can't just claim anything i cannot give you any method and i would say i don't know about its uh, you know efficacy i don't know how well it works so i i need to give some guarantee so mostly we uh, mathematics people we give guarantee we uh, proof things um, so so maybe I can uh, ask for that, OK, if, if I cannot do the best, can I do, uh, like, can I uh, make use of the resources which can be used, uh, like, which is like optimal, minimum number of resources I can use, can I use the twice number of that? So if, even if I can give that guarantee that I'm not taking uh, more than twice of the number required, that is also good, because I'm giving some guarantee to it. So these kind of, these, different approaches gives rise to different areas so i had uh, my in my phd i worked in uh, algorithmic graph theory so mostly i asked uh, these kind of question like uh, whether uh, some problem we can find some efficient solution or not if it is not there is a way to prove it that you cannot find an efficient solution and if we cannot do it in general then what can we uh, say about some restricted kind of models. Uh, so these kind of study I have done in my PhD. And as PhD, I would say that PhD is like a training of doing research, that you learn how to ask questions, how you learn some tools, how you will apply those tools, and 
you learn to think you have this research exposure in phd and after that all your life you learn new things and you will explore new fields uh, so uh, here i am i am doing postdoc here and now i am looking for other approaches uh, because you cannot uh, study everything in five years. In fact, your lifetime is short for that. So uh, I am uh, doing now these different kind of things. And yeah, so that is postdoc. You just uh, dig deeper and you, you expand your knowledge. You try to ask differently. You try to think differently. You go in different fields. Uh, and that you can do all your life in your research career. Also, I want to talk about, like Sushmita said, that uh, it is unfortunate that uh, theoretical computer science, you won't uh, study this uh, field and get to know about this field uh, in your school time, maybe in college, and maybe in, uh, when you'll be in your master's. But that was fortunately for me. That was very fortunate because I never uh, thought of uh, doing research when I was uh, in school or in fact in, the, in my undergrad. So because I do not come from an academic background like academic family or I had no examples in front of me, uh, around me, uh, who had like, who are researchers, who are scientists. And uh, so I didn't know anything about that. Like uh, what is research? How do we do that? And some uh, like, when I was in undergrad, uh, in my final years, I got to know about uh, this entrance exam uh, uh, of doing master's program in IITs. And I was so happy, uh, excited uh, after knowing about that because I was like, it is one way to you know, get out and uh, see bigger picture, like what is happening. And as you all might be dreaming of IITs, uh, most of you, I'm sure. Uh, so. I, I was very happy that this is an opportunity. Even I did not like consider engineering uh, at my when I was in 12, but now I got an opportunity. I may be able to get it. So I prepared for it and cracked the exam. And so I uh, did my master's program in mathematics in IIT Delhi. And I got to see many uh, things, like it transformed me completely. There I got to know about these areas, like graph theory, combinatorics, and like algorithms. So there only I decided that, yeah, I want to, I, I enjoy doing it. I enjoy learning these subjects. And I want to dig deeper. And I want to take up on research. So that's when I decided to do PhD. So yeah, I did my PhD there. So I, from this, I just want to say that you can start from anywhere. May, you may not be thinking about it now, but, but you all are very fortunate that you get, got an opportunity to be here to uh, listen all about research, how to do it, what is happening right now in different uh, areas, in different fields, in different subjects. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, but maybe somebody who is watching on YouTube or maybe you can tell your friends uh, about it that if even if you are an average student and you are not thinking about it right now, uh, you can think of it like maybe in, at some moment you can start. You can start pondering over it and maybe at some point you uh, like you get something exciting or something fascinating and you can start over there and uh, yeah that's it uh, any questions if you want thank you in computer science. Yes. Uh, why is it so important to computer scientists and why is it so hard to prove? Okay. Or why is it so hard to solve? It is like uh, fees not NP. Uh, this problem is very important like because the whole uh, theories ha have built up upon this. 
uh, it's like when we are saying uh, i just about was telling you that about efficiency uh, that there is a method to prove that uh, there does not exist like you cannot design any efficient algorithm for this so we claim to say that that it is not that are always true we say upon this hypothesis that if p is not equal to np then we do not uh, there does not exist such algorithm eff efficient algorithm for this problem so this the whole theory of np completeness the whole theory of approximation algorithm parameterized complexity there are uh, many fields they are based upon these hypotheses so if it becomes p is equal to np then it, it will collapse like everything is you can solve you don't know just the method because you cannot talk about the non existence of anything it's like a model they have designed that okay these kind of problems all are equivalent and if you can solve one of these problem you can solve probably everything and this is the uh, like the hypothesis like p is not equal to np so people believe that it is not equal to np but yeah it, we don't know who will prove it and how long it will take and maybe sushmita if you want to say something upon that uh, do all of you know what this p versus np question is do you want to explain what this uh, is um, i know it like i know a very simple definition it just piece it just states that if you can verify the output of a program uh, very easily then the program itself is easy to design i think that's the uh, uh, okay that would be the p being equal to np and that's exactly what we don't think should be the case so let me give you a more abstract example okay if i hear beautiful music or music i can enjoy i can sort of appreciate it as being beautiful right but composing that music should be at least more difficult should be significantly more difficult than actually listening to that music and drawing enjoyment from it right that much we understand so if i frame that question in a very concrete tangible and quant quantitative form what that means is i can look at a solution and if it's written properly like a proof right step by step i can verify whether this sequence of statements actually leads to the conclusion that it is claiming that is very different from actually composing that proof correct so that's why verification can be done faster but perhaps not all proofs can be written fast that's the p versus np question and why do we care so much about proving this why really is because lot of systems in real world in particular cryptographic system they are based fundamentally on the question that there are problems that don't have a very fast solution okay okay ma'am so if p were to become equal to np but actually the cryptographic systems are based on more uh, harder assumptions meaning like more stronger assumptions which would imply p not equal to np but leave that aside if suppose p were to be equal to np then that means is that no uh, cryptographic protocol is actually existing cryptographic protocols are secured so you know what the implications of that is right it would be greatly concerning for the military for a financial institution and so on and so forth so this is why we care about this problem so much it forms a bedrock of way, the way we understand computation and the way computation those computational models have been used to design systems that sort of permeate our existence thank you ma'am okay so this is the way why is it difficult well i think that that's a much more diff lots of things have been tried and at times different things different um, sort of proof techniques seem to be very promising but for each one of them it was then later on subsequently proved that that is somehow not sufficient to address this particular question and there's a long sequence of results in that direction and to get a taste of that it would be very hard to explain uh, that in very lay terms but uh, i mean i i uh, invite you all to study com uh, the theoretical computer science in some formal capacity and try and see if you can find uh, video lectures on things like 
classical complexity and so on and so forth. Those things in popular science lectures and so on and so forth, maybe I can share something with Arjit later on to sh uh, share with you all. They will explain why, what all those techniques have been uh, tried, which have proved finally to be insufficient to address this particular question. Okay? okay thank you. So that's it. It's not for lack of effort or clever people trying a bunch of different things. It's just that it, they were shown to be that somehow that is not enough. So we are waiting for the right technique, I guess, right set of ideas, which will all pull together. Uh, and to show this question. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, ma'am. I'm sure you all have lot of other a lot of questions. You can catch up with the professors uh, during lunch break. I also uh, request, if you are okay with it, you can uh, put down your email ID on the um, board. There are uh, chalk pieces, so that, that they can uh, send you questions and you can discuss further. So, are you all inspired? How many of you want to be scientists now? Oh, that's bad. Come on, more. How many of you want to be theoretical scientists? Okay, good. Theoretical scientists. Okay, that's nice. I thank all the panelists who have uh, come and inspired uh, the students uh, for uh, becoming scientists. And I hope uh, many more will uh, uh, realize the importance of doing this research. And I thank you, all, thank all of you as well. I would like to introduce our next the day, Professor Prakash Saivasan. He is currently a faculty at IMSC. He completed his PhD from Chennai Mathematical Institute. He will talk to us about what we can compute. With that, I would like to request Professor to take over. So, hello everyone. Uh, I was standing in one of the corner and I was listening to some of your questions and Somebody in the audience was very interested in the uh, importance of P not equal to NP or equal to NP. Uh, I hope to answer to an extent this question and some more questions and I hope I can make it fun for you. So what we want to uh, learn today is what we can compute. But before we go into understanding what we can compute, we should understand what computation means. Right? So what is a computation? Um, I'm sure I saw many kids using mobile phones uh, during the lunch break. So you're all not, you're all very familiar with computers. Computers are om omnipresent. Come on, mobile, mobile phones are essentially computers also. So you play games, you use your mobile phones and so on. You go to a doctor, he uses a computer. And if you want to travel, then again you use a computer. I mean, you have interface with computer. In fact, very interestingly, there is a there is something called a burger ATM. So you just punch in some uh, things that you like, and the machine actually produces burgers for you. So this is called a burger ATM, and we have computers even to make burgers today. But what do you think is common to all these things? Any question? Any answers? Calculation is correct, but and what does it do? What what does this? It, it's it's a program, right? You write a program. I mean, program is one that actually drives a computer, right? So, what is a computation? Computation is something that can be computed by a program. A computer by itself is useless. In fact, I had a very interesting definition that I read that computer is like a lo loyal dog. And programs are like instructions that you give to the loyal dog which takes it and performs it obediently. So computers without programs are useless. So a computation is what program can achieve. So this is how we define what a computation is. Good. But you might say, okay, I you might ask, what is a program? And then you might say, okay, I have my fam favorite program. I like C. Somebody might say, I like Java. Somebody might like say, somebody likes Pascal and Cobol. Nobody, of, none of you will say because I don't even think you might have heard this name. But we don't want to deal with this mess. We don't want to prefer one program over the other. So we work with something called algorithm. So algorithm is like a blueprint. You can think of it as a blueprint and program is something that implements the algorithm. So now we redefine our computation as 
one that can be achieved by an algorithm. A, we say a problem is computable if there is an algorithm to solve it. So this is what we mean by what a computation is. Very good. Uh, okay, so now the question is what all can we compute? Now we know the definition of what, what, a, what is computability, right? Computability is one which has a algorithm which can solve it. A problem for which uh, there is a solution using an algorithm, we call it as a computable problem. And now the question that we want to answer is, what is computable? What, what all problems can we have an algorithm? Efficient algorithm, not so efficient algorithm, can we have an algorithm at all? See, these are the questions that we want to ask. So let me start with a simple puzzle. Okay, the puzzle is like this. I give you a graph. So you all know what a graph is, right? All of you. Yeah, so graph is nothing but it has some set of, uh -oh. it has some set of vertices and there are edges between it. So I have uh, labeled all the edges. For instance, this edge is A, this edge is B, this edge is C, and somehow I forgot to label all the vertex because it is not so useful for us at this moment. But we will come to graphs where we also have labels for vertices. Good. Now I want you to find a path that visits each edge exactly once and returns back to the starting vertex. So I will rephrase this problem. When I say re returns back to the starting vertex, it means that it looks like a cycle. So I will just rephrase this as, can you find a cycle that visits each edge only once? There was some hand. No, I think you were the first to raise the hand. Or Okay, somebody. Yeah, please. Go ahead. Yeah. You already have it written down. Wonderful. Yeah, I have like mouth the size. Uh, I think, can I uh, describe in terms of just the points? Okay. So yeah, you can start from the, so within the square, you can start from the bottom left. You want to start from the bottom left here. Bottom left. Bottom left here. Yeah, then okay. it was F A. F A. Uh, wait, no, sorry, sorry. Um, starting in, starting again from the bottom left, really sorry. I forgot what I had done. Uh, starting in from bottom left, uh, go through I, hmm? G. Uh, J. Okay. Uh, C D. C D. Um, then go through E. Okay. Uh, F A. F A. B. And then go through H. H. And okay. Back. This is probably one. And there are many others. For instance, you could even start from this node, right? And you can have an yeah, please. It is Eulerian cycle that we are talking about. Exactly. We'll come there. Uh, I mean, in fact, my next slide has, yes, please. Yes, there are many solutions. So I don't want to just iterate over all the solutions. There are many solutions. Very good. So somebody said about Eulerian paths or Eulerian circuits, right? So a cycle that visits all the edges are called Eulerian, Eulerian circuit. But now suppose I ask you with a different graph and ask you to identify a Eulerian circuit for this. There are not many hands, okay. So I don't think you can. You can't. I, I, okay, so let us, um, let us explain to others who do not know why you cannot. We will do this. So uh, apparently for this graph, uh, so for apparently for this graph, you cannot have a Eulerian circuit. We will see why. So there is a history to this problem. So there is, a, this problem is called the Konigsberg Bridge problem. This Konigsberg is a city in, still a city in Russia, but it is not, no longer called by the name Konigsberg. It is called by some grad, I don't know. Uh, so this was the map of this Konigsberg, and the people there, so th this is a river of Pregel, and it had seven bridges, and people during their Sundays wanted to, I mean, they had a habit of, walking around the city. In fact, they used to cross bridges, go to the other side, come back to their home. And they had a curious question and wondered if whether it is possible to uh, cross each bridge exactly once and come back to the place where they started. Now you look, uh, you see this, this is somewhat like the question that we asked, right? We asked whether there is a path in the graph from a vertex such that we can go over all the edges and come back to the starting place where we started. So this is somewhat like this. 
and apparently they could not solve it or they tried for many weeks many years i do not know but they could not solve it so they went and approached euler so euler initially thought it was such a simple problem and it is a very uninteresting problem in fact in his own words it say, he said the question is so banal but it seems to me worthy of attention in that geometry nor algebra or not even art of counting was sufficient to solve it you should all remember that this problem this incident happened about 200 years old or even more than 200 years old and at that point there was not enough techniques to solve this problem and in fact we have one of the uh, drawings of euler from the archives of euler and he actually solved this problem now let us come back to uh, okay even before this you see the graph that i actually asked is very similar to the graph that people asked euler so this is the same question that i am asking you guys so let us come back to the problem so one uh, initial way that you all might have attempted to get a solution for this is to find all possible permutations of the edges and see check whether a permutation is feasible or not this is one approach that you might have taken right yeah so this is something called exhaustive search it, it is to go over all the permutations of the edges and see whether some of the edges is feasible or not but this is very costly affair right this takes so these are there are 10 edges and if you want to go over all permutations then you have to go over 10 factorial many permutations and let us see how this factorial uh, function grows now you have this 2 power n so the 2 power n i just wrote down where for some of the n's that i liked the values of 2 power n for instance 2 power 2 is 4 2 power 5 is 32 2 power 7 is 128 and so on and for n factorial 2 power 2 factorial is 2, 5 factorial is 150, 7 factorial is 540, 10 factorial is, I don't want to say the uh, digit here because I mean it's fairly large. Similarly, n power n is some uh, 2 power 2 is 4, 5 power 5 is this, 7 power 7 is something very strange number, and 10 power 10 is 1 followed by 10 digits and so on. So you see this n factorial is somehow sandwiched between 2 factor 2 power n and n power n and all these are not very efficient for us we don't want n in the power at all so n factorial is between 2 power n and n power n and any of this this 2 power n function n factorial n power n all these things are something that scares us okay now the question is we don't want to do this exhaustive search can we do something better so the problem is can we solve this problem a bit more efficiently some of you might know the answer for it bear with me i mean you will have more things to learn from this talk but for others this was solved by euler so before describing a euler solution i need some definitions so we say graph is connected if there is a path between every pair of vertices for example this graph is a connected graph because you take any two vertex you can always find a path so for instance if you take this and this there is a path between two of them so let us look at a graph which is not connected so this is connected of course let us look at a graph which is not connected so for instance if i pick a vertex here and here there is no path between them so path is just a sequence of edges that take can take you from one vertex to another so for for instance this and this does not have a path good now we also need another notion called degree of a vertex so the degree of vertex is number of edges that connects it for instance if you take this vertex there are two edges arising out of it and if you take this vertex there are two vertex uh, two edges arising out of it if you take this vertex there is one edge arising out of it so i have just marked the degree for instance the degree of this is 2 2 2 2 these two are one for instance so you all understand what a degree is right now what euler did was he observed something very remarkable he said that a graph has an euler circuit if and only if it is connected and every vertex has an even degree so what is the intuition behind this suppose i am in a vertex okay you have to exit that vertex 
and then you want to enter back that vertex. So every time you exit, you take uh, an edge. Every time you enter it, you take an other edge. So you see that there is an even number of edges that you uh, touch each time you visit a vertex. So this is the intuition of why this, why this statement is true. Now I put back this graph and I put back this degrees. Now whatever you said is true. One of you. Uh, who said you said, right? One of you. So that so there are vertices with odd number of odd degree and hence we cannot have a Euler circuit for this particular graph. So is this all okay for you? Now if I ask you to write an algorithm to find an find whether Euler circuit exists or not, what would you do? You would go over each vertex, compute its degree, and then check whether the degree is even or odd. If, if you find a, a vertex with odd degree, then you will say, oh, this guy does not have an Euler circuit at all. Okay, I just realized that there are people sitting on top also. <laughs> Sorry. And if you don't find a vertex with uh, odd degree at all, then you will say, yes, the, I mean, this is a good graph and it has an Euler circuit. And how, what is the time that you will take? Remember, we initially take, took n factorial, but going over each vertex is very simple. There are n vertex, you go over each one of them, and maybe you do some computation to uh, find its degree, and you can answer. So it is some function of n which is good for us, which is efficient. So this we call it efficient. Very good. So where are we? Yeah. This is the map of Konigsberg now. It is no longer called Konigsberg. Unfortunately, during the World War II, all the bridges were destroyed, and you can no longer ask the same question that you asked once upon a time. You had a question or no? OK. OK, good. OK, now you might say, oh, but you are, you are cheating. I mean, uh, you say yes or no. Given a graph, you say yes or no. But can I actually find the circuit? Can I, I mean, can I write down the circuit? There are algorithms for it also, and there are efficient algorithms. Efficient as in it is not like 2 power n, n power n, or n factorial. There are quite efficient algorithms for doing this. Yeah, so the Euler method only tells you how to check whether there is a circuit or not. It does not give you an answer of whether how to build this circuit or how to write down this circuit. So how do you write down this circuit? Let, let us assume that you already have used the Euler's uh, algorithm to check that there is a Euler circuit and after that you want to write down this. For this again I have to define a few things which are not very difficult. I mean you might have seen these definitions before but for the sake of completeness we will go over it again. So I will define what a cut edge is. It is very similar, very, uh, very intuitive. So what is a cut edge? Edge if you cut it just cuts the graph into two. This is the definition of cut edge. So you have a graph, and if you take that red, red edge out, then you cut the graph into two. It becomes disconnected, right? So this is the definition of what a cut edge in a graph is. Similarly, the red edge there is also a cut edge because it just disconnects the graph. Is this okay? Very good. Now what I will do is, to find a circuit, I will start removing the edges, but I will check whether it is a cut edge or not. If it is a cut edge, and if there is another possibility of removing another edge, then I will remove that. I will not remove the cut edge. So this is my algorithm. So what is the algorithm? I start from any vertex, delete an edge starting from it, move to the next vertex, and then I will repeat this process. But I will only delete a cut edge if there are no other edges. So let us go over an example and see what I do. So I have a pointer here. I start from this node, and then I delete A. I have multiple choices, I, G, B. I can delete any, of, any one of them, because none of them are cut edge. I don't know which one I delete. I think I delete a B. Then again, I have multiple choices, C, J, H. I delete a C. Now, D is a cut edge, but it is the only edge, so I delete it. Now, I don't know which one I delete. I think I delete a G, do I? 
Yes, I delete a G because then I get a cut edge. Now you see, uh, now I don't have an option, so I have to delete I. Now you see this F is a cut edge, so I cannot delete this cut edge. So I will delete some other edge other than cut edge. It is not the only edge and it is a cut edge. So I delete H for instance and I get my Euler circuit. So this is also an efficient procedure, right? You just go over each vertex, find the edges and start deleting them one by one. The algorithm will terminate because you, only, you have only finitely many edges. You delete one at, at least one at each point and then you only have to look at the number of uh, edges that are incident in that particular vertex. So you have some efficient algorithm which runs in, say, let us say, n squared or so. So we call this efficient because now we don't have n in the exponent. You don't have something like n power n. We only have n squared as our, uh, as our running time. Good. So there are many problems that we can efficiently solve. For instance, sorting. Have you all seen sorting? So you're, you might, you all have programming knowledge, right? I hope so. So sorting is you are given an array. So you all know what an array is, right? Is okay, right? To most of you, okay. So sorting is you are given an array and you are given some numbers and you want these numbers in ascending or descending order. For instance, this we can know, we know how to sort, solve it efficiently. We'll put it in a bag. Searching. So you are again given an array and you are given a number and you want to find whether that number is there in this array or not. This we know how to solve efficiently. And if you are given a if you are given a graph and you are given two nodes in it, two vertex in it, and you want to find whether there is a path from the say for instance you have a graph and then you are given S and T, you want to find whether there is a path from S and T. This you, this also you can find. There are efficient algorithms to find. In some sense, we know how to do it well. And these are all very simple algorithms. You can go back home, try to read it yourself, and I mean, try to understand. These are very simple algorithms that you can do it on your own. And all these things can be computed very efficiently. OK. Now what I do is I slightly change the puzzle. So you remember, we asked in the previous uh, example, whether there is an edge, uh, whether there is a cycle involving all the edges. Now I ask whether there is a cycle involving all the vertices. So can you find a cycle that visits every vertex only once? This again you should be able to do it very immediately, please. Hmm? No, but you just say one, two, three, four, five. I think this will work. One, two, three, four, five, six. Huh. Yeah, there are many things. The simplest one would be one, two, three, four, five, six, one. This is just so that we warm up and know what the problem is. So what is this? We want to find a cycle that revisits every vertex exactly once. If you do one, two, three, four, five, six, come back to one exactly once, uh, I mean, modulo the first vertex that you ask. You had a doubt or who had a doubt? It doesn't have to traverse every edge, no. Okay, good. Now I can ask you, so this is called a Hamiltonian cycle. So if, if I ask, can you find a cycle that visits every vertex only once, this is called a Hamiltonian cycle. And now you can rephrase it as, can you find a Hamiltonian cycle? Now, of course, this was an easy puzzle. Now I ask you for a slightly more difficult puzzle. Yes? Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 5, 1. 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 5, 1. Fantastic. But suppose I give you a, so I have only easy examples here. So suppose I give you a very hard example. I mean, it's, a, it's very difficult. For instance, if I ask you this, maybe you'll, you'll be able to find it. But what is the procedure that you applied? You search for a path, right? You search for a path. Do you agree with me here? Hmm? Trial and error. So exactly. Now, if you want to do a trial and error, and if I give you a very big graph, what is the, so let me. So, but one thing is very important here. 
that if the solution that he gave, I could very easily check it, right? But if he had said a wrong solution, then I could have caught him. But he gave a uh, correct solution. But if he had given a wrong solution, I could have caught him, right? So the in this problem, if you give me a solution, it is easy to check. But if I have to find out a solution, as she said, you only can do it by trial and error. Now, question is, can you do better? But if you do trial and error, then the complexity is v factorial, which is like n power n, right? Between n power n and 2 power n. This is, this is what we saw. Now, I won't ask you this question whether you can do it efficiently or not, because as of today, we do not know whether there is an efficient algorithm or not. So this, that is why it is a, it is a no in the bracket with a question mark. Okay. So as of today, for this simple problem, we do not know if there is an efficient algorithm or not. And there are many, algo many problems. So this probably answers. Somebody asked a question of p not equal to n p, right? Yes. So there are many problems which are real life problems, which are very interesting problems that we want to solve, for which we do not have know an answer. We do not know whether there is an efficient algorithm or not. For example, Sudoku, not the version that you would be playing. We don't look at 9 cross 9, but n cross n, generalization of the Sudoku n cross n, we don't know how to solve it efficiently. We know how to solve it, we don't know how to solve it efficiently. Timetable, oh, so let us put this into a bag. Timetable, I mean, all your teachers are, I mean, they work very hard to create timetable. But you can't write a program which is efficient. So if you have teachers saying that, yeah, please. Oh. So if you have, a, if you have say, some teachers teaching 100 people, some teachers teaching 50 people, and some clans, classrooms which can only accommodate 50 people, some classrooms which can accommodate 100 people, if you have such constraints, then we don't know how to, whether, first of all, whether there is a timetable and how to compute this timetable. You cannot have a generic program to compute this timetable. Partition problem. Suppose I give you a set of numbers and ask you to partition this into two sets so that both, some of both the sets are the same. For example, this simple problem, we don't know if there is an efficient algorithm. Traveling salesman problem. There is a very interesting picture that I will tell you soon, or I will show you soon. So what is traveling salesman problem? You can think of it as a postman's problem. So postman has certain houses that he wants to deliver his courier or post, and he wants to find the shortest route such that he does not visit any of the house twice. This, for this, we do not know. This, you can see this is slightly connected to the uh, Hamiltonian cycle problem that we saw, but it is like it is not exactly the same problem. So, traveling salesman problem is also a problem for which we do not know if there is an efficient algorithm or not. Let us put all these things into a, a bag. I will show you a very ah. So, these these problems were for whom we do not know uh, for uh, problems for which we know how. To, if you give me a solution, I can check it, but. If you ask me to come up with a solution, I do not know how to do it efficiently. We group them all as a NP-complete problem. And the very nice part about it is, if you can solve any of them, you can solve all of them. So yes, please. I don't want to go into it. It is called non-deterministic polynomial, but I don't want to go into it. Into it. So I mean, it is a technical term. But uh, let us just call it NP for now, OK? Very good. So what was I saying? Yeah, so we just group all these problems. And the interesting part is, if I can solve any one of them, then I can solve all of them. And it is not that only these problems. There are very many problems like this. I mean, there are tons of problems like this. Very good. So I will show you an interesting map that uh, I took. I did not know when it will be useful, but it is now useful. So I had a courier that was coming to me, and I was able to track that courier. So the courier wala, so was uh, delivering the couriers to all these places. And my house was somewhere here. And I was impatiently waiting that he will come, but he went all around my house, but except to, to my house. He was not coming to my house. 
and I was forgiving because I know the traveling salesman problem is a bit hard problem. So, <laughs> okay, very good. Now we want to understand what P versus NP, this problem. So, there was somebody who asked P versus NP, right? Yeah, you have a question or no? Please. Yeah. So suppose uh, we have uh, high numbers, uh, mm -hmm. we can take n byte to so the uh, No, no, no. The numbers can repeat. Numbers can repeat. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, we had this bag of all the problems that we know we can efficiently solve. And we had this bag uh, which we said we know how to, if you give me a solution, I can check. But I cannot come up with a solution on my own. Now the famous P versus NP problem asks whether these two bags can be the same or they are necessarily different. This is P not equal to NP or P equal to NP. So this is the problem that has been haunting mathematicians for very long time. This is actually a million dollar problem. And uh, Clay Mathematical Institute lists it as one of the seven uh, problems of the millennium. And they have also they also have a milli, million dollar prize for this problem. So, if any one of you can solve it, not only do you become famous, you also become rich. Maybe now the number of hands will go up. I mean, number of scientists who want to, number of people who want to become scientists, maybe it goes up. Okay, very good. So we have this P versus NP that we we all know now what P versus NP is. Suppose you know that okay. The question is, can computer do everything? This is a question that we want to answer. Suppose you know that the program will take a lot of time. You are still brave enough to write a program for it. Maybe traveling salesman problem. You still want to write a program for it, no matter what. Okay? Then, but now you have a doubt. After writing the program, now you have a doubt. Whether I wrote my program correctly or not. I am willing to wait. But I don't want to wait till I retire or become very old. Okay. So what you want to be sure is that you have not put, in, you have not accidentally introduced some loop, never-ending loop. So you want to be, you want to ensure whether that program will halt or not. Okay. So now the pro, the now what you will get an idea, wonderful idea. Okay. Now I have written this program. Can I write another program to check whether this program will halt or not? Now, uh, what you do is, now you want to write this program, but you are not sure whether you can actually write it or not. So this problem of asking whether there is a program to check if your program halts is called the halting problem. And, okay, maybe for interest of time, I will skip these two things. And this was actually, uh, this was actually studied well by Alan Turing. There is a story behind this also. There was a very famous mathematician called Hilbert and he wanted to know many things. Among these things, he wanted to know whether there is a simple procedure to prove every mathematical theorems. So, can you algorithmically generate this proof or can you, at least there is a procedure wherein you can write down this proof. Yeah. No, Godel's incompleteness is the answer to that question. This is the answer to a different question. And uh, I mean, this is among the questions. Godel incompleteness is answer to one of the questions that uh, Hilbert asked. We will not get into it again. Okay, so Alan Turing was the one who actually uh, showed that, first he showed that there cannot be a program that can take a program and say whether it is halting or not. So we don't have a, we cannot have a program. So this is a very powerful statement. I mean, if you think about it, you are saying that no matter which computer, no matter which era you are in, you cannot have an algorithm which takes another algorithm or you cannot have a program which takes another program and tells you the answer whether it holds or not. We will see why this is true. I think you will have, we will have enough time for this. Okay, but you get my get the problem that we are trying to ask, right? All of you. Can you? 
So, Turing machine is a mathematical modulation of your programs. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, there cannot be a program which can take another program and tell you whether that program hurts or not. Yes, but I'm not saying that it it can't take one algorithm and check whether it terminates or not. I'm one program. Mm. Okay, so for instance, I did skip the question here. For instance, if the program can be very complicated, right? For instance, if I ask you whether this loop terminates or not, I don't know the answer. Maybe you know it, but I don't know the answer. So your functions can be as complicated, very complicated. So now what you are requiring is you want another program that takes this program, takes some values for x and y, and check whether this program terminates ever. So what we are saying is there cannot be a program that give me any program, I cannot claim that give me any program, I will be able to tell you whether it holds or not. We will actually see a proof of why this is true. Or we can also have a discussion after the... Uh... Okay. So let us say, this is the famous halting problem. You might have heard of it, you might not have heard of it, it's okay. But you hear it now. Now what is this halting problem? This halting problem, as we said, is whether there is a program that takes another program and data and tells you whether it halts or loops forever. Suppose we had such a program. I mean, we are magicians, we create such a program and somebody comes and claims to you that he has a program. So this is, what, this is our supposition. Suppose we had a program H that takes another program plus data and says whether it halts or loops. So what is the strategy that we will apply? We will construct another program using this program for which H will fail. This is the strategy that we will apply. Okay? So how do we build this another program that I promised you? Okay, this is now becoming a bit more technical, but uh, I mean, if you don't understand it, uh, don't, uh, don't be... Uh, don't be disheartened because you will understand it eventually. I mean, in one or two years, you might you might uh, learn about this proof again. So, what? How do we construct this program? <coughs> Let us say we want to construct this program, and it takes a program. It makes two copies of it. Remember, this program H took program plus data. So, what it does is it takes a program, and then comp and also assumes that the program itself is the data, and gives it to H. This H does not know about anything. I mean, it just takes this program, it considers this program as the data, and then it tells some answer. Suppose it tells, it halts, this program halts. Then what I will do is, I will loop. So it, if this program returns halt, then I will loop. And if this program says this program will loop, then I will halt. This is what it does. So do you understand the construction? Is there any... Uh, doubt about the construction. So you're saying program and given the input being the program, program. the data has what the program you already have? No, it only takes a program, you see. It only takes a program, then duplicates it, considers one part as the data. You can think of it as a file. Program is a file, right? Data could also be a file, for instance. Yeah, go so ahead. if it says it was, then you loop, or if it says you loop, you just stop that. Exactly. This is the construction, OK? So what it does, it takes a program, it duplicates the program, and then provides, inputs this to the program H that we promised, that we imagined that is there. Then this program H tells you, right? We, it promises, it promised that it either tells yes or no answer, that the program will halt or no. So depending on what the answer you get, suppose you get that it halts, then I will loop. If it says it does not halt, it loops then I will actually, I will stop, okay? Now think about what happens if I actually give program N as an input. So if I give program, this is program N, I give this program itself as the input, okay? 
now now this guy takes program n program n and he says this will halt but program n on knowing that this guy is going to answer halt will go and loop right and program n if it actually if this program h says it actually loops then this guy actually goes and stops do you agree with me here let me re write this uh, let me put this argument before you so suppose n halts <coughs> suppose uh, okay i should have said 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 it the other way so suppose n maybe let us look at it this way suppose h says n loops n on n loops then n on input n halts do you agree with me here so suppose h says n on n loops then n on input n halts because it just takes the answer of h whatever it says and does the opposite n is actually for negation the program negates whatever h says it just negates right do you all agree with me or is this too confusing this is okay right and what happens if h says it halts suppose h says n on n halts then n actually loops this is how you designed your algorithm right it is how you wrote your program it took the value of h and h says if it halts then i actually loop and if it says it if it loops then actually halt so it has actually countered this program h program h now the output of the program is wrong do you agree with me here do you agree with me here all of you or is there doubts here i mean i'm fag end of the talk but this is a important concept that i thought i will try to get it across okay so what is the problem here the problem was that we assumed that there is such a program in the initial initially we assumed that there is a program h so this is something called proof by contradiction so you assume something that was false and hence you got into a contradiction so our initial assumption has to be wrong so there is a slight bit of history behind this problem also there is somebody called cantor and you all know what is a natural number and real numbers right so cantor actually proved that the set of real numbers so you know that both of them are infinite right natural number is infinite real numbers is infinite cantor actually proved that the real number infinity is much larger than the natural number infinity and this was somewhat very similar proof this proof uh, proof technique that use that is used here is uh, is borrowed or i would not say maybe i should not say borrowed but it is inspired by the cantor's proof for proving that the set of real numbers or uh, he, uh, um, he okay uh, okay let me put it this way uh he proved something else but you could as a corollary also say that uh, set of real numbers uh is much larger than the set of natural numbers both are infinite but one one infinity is actually much larger than the other infinity very good so in fact you can also see this uh as a corollary of cantor's argument because the number of programs are infinite of course but they are smaller in smaller infinity and the number of program behaviors are much bigger infinity so you cannot have a program which can recognize all the behaviors this is somehow you can also see this as that but anyway we will just stick to the proof that we did very good so our assumption that program h is h existed was wrong so this is the wrong assumption that we started this is the reason why we came into an contradiction and again don't uh, i mean don't be disheartened if you did not understand the proof it is just that i did not explain it properly and it is very hard proof so you will learn it at some point in your life so as a summary what did we see we saw that some problems can be efficiently solved for some problems we don't know if it can be efficiently solved so i want to say that it is not that np completeness is all the problems that are uh, not efficiently solved there are some problems for which you can't even check given a solution whether it is feasible or not efficiently so there are uh, i mean there are hierarchy of difficult problems np completeness is somehow the first among them 
And we also saw that the, some problems cannot be solved at all if, as a computation. As a, you cannot have programs that can solve some problems also. So with this, I thank you all for uh, So maybe we can have one or two quick questions, right? Yeah, thanks. We thank uh, Professor Prakash Shaivasan for this wonderful talk. Uh, so the podium is open for questions for five minutes. And then we move on to the next talk. Maybe you can limit it one or two, no? I think uh, five or maybe one or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, but uh, yeah, Dr. Prakash, Professor Prakash has agreed and he is kindly in going to be in the campus. He's in his room and he will be also available during snacks to interact. Okay. Yeah. So sure, questions? Sure. Anyone? There are many during the talk, so if you are all satisfied, then it's also okay. Upstairs, anyone? Want to have a question? There, there, I think. Yeah. Okay. Hey, could you just repeat what the full form of NP is? Non-deterministic poly polynomial time. So it involves some bit of history that you need to, so you talked about Turing machines, right? So there is something called deterministic Turing machine and non-deterministic Turing, Turing machine. So, or I can, uh, let us call it GP, okay? Non-determinism just means guess. So if you guess, then it is polynomial time. If you can guess a solution, then it is polynomial time. So this is what it essentially means. Thank you. You had a question. Thank you. Another question. Sir, if uh, N P represents a set which is compute, uh, non computable and P set represents a set which is computable, then how can they both be equal? We don't know whether they are no, equal or not. This they cannot be, no, sir, because it's it completely contradicts each other. No, we, so suppose that tomorrow you say that I can solve Sudoku in polynomial time. I have a very efficient algorithm that solves Sudoku in polynomial time. Then whole N P basket comes into the P basket. So at this point we don't know. So the point is, you, if if you want to say that there is no algorithm, you need a proof for it. So we okay, don't know so a proof that will actually say that there is no algorithm. So for instance, we saw that halting problem has no algorithm, right? So similarly, we need a proof which says that these pro these problems have no algorithm in this particular time. Okay, sir. So this we do not know. This proof we do not know. Yes. Sir. And we believe that it is not true. I mean, at least I believe that P is not equal to NP. Others may believe P equal to NP also. But uh, I mean, if P is equal to NP, all bad things happen. This is what I am told, for instance. So. Uh, Uh, sir, sup Sorry. Uh, sir, suppose I have a solution to one of the uh, P. Then you can solve all the problems and you are famous and you become a millionaire. Also. No, sir. Uh, you said uh, there are solutions but none of them are uh, efficient, right, sir? They are not efficient. Suppose I have a solution, how do I determine if it's efficient or not? You have to prove that the algorithm corrects, is correct. In some sense, you have to show that uh, the algorithm actually does what it claims. It so does. as long as it works, it's uh, efficient? As long as it w works, it is. Okay, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we then thank Prakash and maybe we request Prakash to put his email address if he's willing to entertain yeah, emails sure. from. Maybe there was one last question. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah. Sir, so I have a doubt regarding the proof. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if we are putting program in inside program in, mm. isn't that going to no, be the case? No, we are not putting p program in inside program in. If you look at my thing, I did not put program in inside program in. Where was it? I put program h inside program n. I'm not put. I'm writing this program n, but I'm only putting program h inside program n. Oh, okay, sir. This is okay. Yeah, thanks. Email. Ah, on the blackboard. Yeah. Uh, there's a workshop there. So uh, it's time to thank Prakash for this wonderful talk. So, to introduce the next speaker, I invite Ms. Priyadarshini. So, hello everyone. You must have heard talks from mathematics, physics and computer science, isn't it? How many of you here like biology? 
oh so many happy hands raising up so you might not think that biology is related to any of these subjects isn't it you can put your hands down okay so but we have a field of research called as computational biology here in imsc and we have chandrani kumari from that field who is doing a phd in that and she is going to tell us how mathematics computer science and biology come together to help people okay so i invite chandrani kumari to give the talk on health informatics in the era of data science what does the data science word scale so health informatics is it is a field of science and engineering that aims at developing algorithm and tools to study the data and um, to process the data and which can come from various sources for example uh, in the health field we have electronic health records we get diagnostic test results we have medical scans and lot of other data we get from the hospitals day to day life whenever we go we um, whenever you go to the hospitals you, uh, you get your test done so from there you get the data you have you give your uh, personal in information for example age bmi so all these data come into the electronic health records right so it is kind of a multidisciplinary field where it uses uh, health data and the informatics to analyze uh, data and get some informatics uh, get some information out of that and insights from the data and make some decision out of that then uh, in the health informatics basically these clinicians they collaborate with, uh, with the it people to make some tools and analyze their data next what is data science so data science as uh, from the name itself it tells the thing operations that you are doing over the data and trying to to get the information out of that so we use ma simple mathematics and statistics we used some specialized programming in the data science so uh, mostly people use python and r for this analysis uh, r also you can use but python has many libraries especially uh, like for example uh, pandas pandas especially deal with the tabular data set so it's very easy for you to analyze those data using pandas library in python then uh, you have numpy arrays in uh, python that that is also very helpful when you do the matrix multiplication and all those things then uh, here comes the new word artificial intelligence and machine learning so i will um, introduce you about these two field in the next slides so 
yeah so artificial intelligence machine learning deep learning everything comes into uh, one paradigm it's called data science so in artificial intelligence we you uh, we have a program that can sense or you can look at uh, there are several algorithms that you can use over the data and uh, so basically in artificial intelligence you make your machine to learn from the data so as the data improves as the you, as you include more and more data your machine will learn more and your results will be more accurate so in ma so machine learning is subset of the artificial intelligence in machine learning we use different algorithms different statistical tools to um, uh, uh, we use over the data to improve our results and we get more accurate results over time and time as we get the more data set then we come uh, this deep learning deep learning is a subset of machine learning where we categorize things into one particular set where we have models inspired from the biology that neurons how the neurons work so there we have uh, neural networks so it takes input from the outside world and they will do some operations what kind of operations it does maybe in the latest slides i will tell you so it will do some operations and they will have some functions at the end and based on that function it will categorize into the output like whether it is yes or no so for example if you are running any neural network for example let's say uh, you want to identify uh, uh, you are given lots of lots of images of cats and dogs right now you want to ident you want to make um, your system to learn that to identify and from the next time when you are giving the image of cat or dog it should categorize into your machine should tell that this is the picture of cat this is the picture of dog so at the end you will have binary output cat or dog label okay yeah so since i have give you lot of idea about the big data do you, can some of you tell me from where we get the uh, big data in nearby like any idea anybody can tell okay so everybody you uh, have seen this ott platforms right so there we see movies lot of web series lot of things lot of videos are there so what are all these these are all big data because we have huge and huge of data are there people are getting from there so sometimes have you wonder that if you watch horror movies you always get suggestion of near side by you will get the su suggestion of movies related to horror movies if you are watching some comedy movie you will get suggestion related to comedy movie right so how these things is happening so the things you are watching at back end your data is getting uh, what do you call analyzed and based on the analysis they are giving you the suggestions same thing social media how many of you on social media either facebook twitter or anything how many of you are nobody okay <laughs> let's crowd <laughs> yeah so one thing have you observed like on facebook when you tag your friend face they will automatically suggest that this 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 person might be this one has anybody observed that so how they are doing so what they are doing whatever the images you are uploading over the facebook they are acquiring all those data they are labeling that this person is x this person is y and once you are going to tag those persons from Uh, the the analysis or the equi uh, in the insights they got from the data they are suggesting you that this is that person or this is th that person so we so every day like if you see twitter lots of lots of tweet tweets we are getting every day every seconds we are getting lots and lots of data so this machine learning artificial intelligence it is not like that it came right now it was there earlier but the only thing was earlier we had the data Uh, we did not had much data because everything was very simple we had just excel sheet we just input the data so we did not had much data so we cannot do uh, those analysis because we had less data but since now we are in the era of data science so we can make lot of insights and lot of analysis from those data and use these techniques okay so this this was the data that we are getting our day to life everybody is aware of now 
I will talk about the data that we are getting in the biology. So we have this sequence data. What is sequence in biology? If I tell. Anybody? What? Genomics. So what what exactly it comes under genomics? What is the basic unit? Nucleotide. A, T, G, C, all those data. Right. So in in current uh, this thing we have lots of sequence data. We have genomics data. We have proteom proteomics data. So you must have heard about the next generation sequencing. So there, like Human Genome Project was one of them. So we there for one single cell, they got around 3.5 GB of sequence. So this kind of data we are getting these days. Next is biomedical images. So what kind of images it will come come under this tag? Right. So X-ray, MRI, uh, then uh, some tissues, image, histopathological images that we get from the labs. So all this data we are getting. So that are also in hospitals. If you see lots and lots of data is coming from the biomedical field. Then we have clinical data. Clinical data consists of EHR, like electronic health records we are getting, then patient information. So we have a lot more data in clinics also. And then omics data. So omics is basically all the words that ends with the omics. For example, genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics. So all these data are there. So we have huge, huge of data in biology as well. As well. So in omics data, so I have just summarized few of the omics. So genomics is basically studying genome, which is like entire set of genes, the genetic landscape of an organism. Uh, proteomics is a study of proteomes, like if you study proteins, then uh, these are proteomics, then transcriptomics. So we are getting these kind of data in biology. So before going into that, like I have just um, uh, like how these images and those we, ha we can use with the uh, artificial intelligence or how can we use machine learning techniques to identify. So one of the example that I will be showing you is uh, the how you can detect, for example, you have a pathological image, for example, cancer tissue cells are there, those images are there. So how can you tell by looking at the images? So one thing is like export can like very good doctor or some uh, uh, somebody in lab who is expert in seeing those images they can tell you that yes this person is having cancer this person is not having cancer right but one thing is like you get expert advice from the uh, experts and you make the database because we have lots of images we, uh, and you can you just label those images that these are the cancerous these are not cancerous and then you make your machine to learn so by making a machine to learn next time when you get the image you just feed the image into that model and you your machine will tell that how uh, I, so machine will label those images whether it, it is having they have cancer or not so cancer is uh, basically what happens so for example there is a tissue town in your uh, body there is a some group of tish, tissue that we call as a town in that town there are some rules and regulations right so what they will do each cell will have to follow those rules like when to divide how to divide so they cannot like randomly start dividing it uh, okay so they will have certain rules but what happened from the outside environment or something inside happens some perturbation is given and suddenly one of the cells start behaving abnormally they are not following any rules. They started dividing abruptly. They started dividing multiple times. Whatever the time period was for one cell, they have just uh, lose that consistency. They have just uh, ignoring those rules and regulations. And they make some group of cells, different cells, which are called hyperlepsia. Right? So, th and then, they, so this group of cells, they will have their own rules. They won't follow neighborhood rules. Now what they are have because of those rules they are following, they, there is a change in their shape, that there is a change in the morphology that you can see with, uh, with, with the microscope. Or the, so that, that process is called diplopsia and this when it begins, uh, when, when, when it grow into a group of cells like that, where there is a change in the morphology of the cells. So that is called in situ cancer. 
so this group of cells they are not behaving normally they uh, i mean the rules and regulation that they were following earlier so they made it as a benign tumor in uh, in that particular site but uh, so now if they have ability to stay at one place that will be in situ cancer but some some of them have ability to move around so they will go into the blood vessels and they will travel to some other body parts and they will start accumulating there they will start making their own tissue town there and with their own rules and regulations that we call as a metastatic cancer where it uh, where it is spread into the whole body so uh, here i will show you how this ca cancer diagnosis in has uh, you, we can do using the histopathological images so you take these images for training for training your model right and then you process the data so just basic image processing uh, thing you do it here and then you will apply neural network so there are different so here they are using using convolution neural network this is a again different uh, another type of neural network so they uh, they operate convolution neural network over there and then they classify into class 0 and 1 so class 0 is benign tumor and class 2 is the metastatic tumor right so can i use a uh, blackboard lights lights on the blackboard lights sir light is it visible to everybody okay so i will just briefly explain you how convolution neural network works so let's say you have an image of n cross n right and so images are basically what 1 and 0 right so it will consist of binary number if you are taking black and white uh, so we have 1 0 0 1 0 so this is the image that we are getting so for example let's say in our example it's this uh, histopathological image of uh, this cancer data so we have this image we will define one filter right so we have this filter we will take this filter and overlap over this image okay and then actually convolution it is just a multiplication nothing else doing maths of multiply nothing else so you will just take this filter and overlap over this so what you will do you will multiply this one with this one so 1 cross 1 plus 0 into 0 plus you do all for all nine numbers you will get some number let's say one or two whatever it is you will you just multiply it and do add in okay so then you will get new set of image here so first first what you are doing you are multiplying this with this set of data now you will take this filter and uh, move it to one cell next next one cell so next one will you will have this cell okay so now again you do the same thing and you will end up once you are reach the end part here now you you don't you will not move this thing again now you take this filter since this row has already done you take next row and multiply over it here then again so like that you will have new set of image so your information will be conserved here but this size will get reduced so n cross n matrix it will reduce to some a uh, different value now so th this is the convolution step okay now next in convolution network what we do is max pooling max pooling or mean pooling so there are two three operations that is so for example i will explain you what is max pooling so i will consider for example this 2 cross 2 matrix here although we have 3 cross 3 i will take 2 cross 2 and i will take the maximum of this number so whatever the maximum number i will get i will put it here in all four uh, val in all four cells whatever the maximum value is i will put it here then i will move my cells to here then take the maximum of this take it here then again next row take maximum here similarly you do for all this now you again your information is conserved but um, 
you are reducing your data so basically now we we are going to uh, at the end where we will uh, make the predictions whether this cancer it is cancerous or not so uh, now we what now you flatten this thing so you put 0 1 1 0 here okay so th now this will act as a uh, single cell right so in neural network what happens you have different input cell here and you assign some weight weight associated randomly you assign some weight to these values and then you will get some uh, so here you will do summation of all those inputs whatever inputs you are getting and whatever the weights are associated with that and then you apply some there are several uh, function for example sigmoid function or relu function you can use and um, so let's say we will use relu function relu is rectified linear unit where this function acts like this if you have this below 0 it will be uh, below 1 it will be 0 and above that it uh, it will be linearly so this is a relu function so based on that it will give you output either it's 0 or 1 so like this you will train your model first now you will have some set uh, so once you train the model you will have this m model from here and now you next time when you get the next image you just put inside this model and you will your model will tell you whether the patient is having a benign tumor or the malignant tumor So this is the image um, that they have fed into uh, this model. So this is the image related to benign uh, model and, uh, and another one is uh, malignant. Okay, so next uh, I will talk about the clinical data. So clinical data as I told you earlier also it consists of electronic health records, then administrative data, then uh, patient and uh, disease registries and uh, some uh, this health surveys and then sometimes it uh, also have the cl uh, clinical trials. So when, when the uh, and one more thing actually I skipped here was the drug discovery I wanted to talk but somehow I missed it. So in drug discovery you have lots more ligands and lots more this thing and you try to uh, check w what is the ligands that are compatible to your uh, receptor and then you so they are having these clinical trials also uh, data in this. That's it. Thank you. Thank you Chandrani for the nice talk. I think data science is an upcoming field. How many of you are interested in data science? Oh, good. Okay, so the floor is now open for questions for Chandarani. Question. So we'll be able to take two, three questions. I think Chandarani will be available during the snack yeah. break to interact outside. Okay, so uh, hello. Uh, I've learned in school about certain techniques like fish technique and microarray, which mm -hmm. talks about uh, like putting a fluorescent DNTP into yeah. the nicks of mm -hmm. the DNA and then labeling cancer tissues like that. Mm -hmm. So, do these techniques also involve uh, hi this histopathological image diagnosis, or do they follow some other path to identify cancer tissues? So in microarray data, you will have image, right? So you can just like that, I have input this histopathological image. Similarly, you can give uh, the, so in microarray data, you will know the what all the expression, uh, what all the genes are getting expressed. So you can use those information as an input to your training. And then, so initially you will know that if gene 1, gene 2, gene 5, gene 8 is getting expressed, then that means uh, this person is having uh, cancer, otherwise they are not having, right? This label you will know initially. So you just put this information into your model, not necessarily the convolution neural network, but there are other machine learning methods. You just put those information into those mo uh, inputs, uh, this thing, and then uh, you train your model, same way that I, I have showed you here, and then uh, again when you have the new test a uh, new data set you just apply into your model and they will predict it for you uv so 
Uh, hello, I have a doubt that uh, whether we, uh, today's uh, health diseases we are showing infections like uh, in humans, no, like fevers. We can collect the uh, data and create an algorithm to diagnose the disease. Is this possible? What uh, I did not get li the symptoms. We can create it as an algorithm, right? That this is the this is the disease. This is a medicine we can diagnose. Ah, so like in clinical data, what we do is like for example, there is some X Y Z disease, and there are some symptoms associated with that disease. Okay. Yes. So ha. Huh, so you you can use those information again as a input to your data and in your model, and then you classify like this disease. If somebody is having this 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 symptoms, they will have this kind of disease. If somebody has this this, then they will have this. So there are different machine learning algorithms. That that take care of this thing. Well, we can using that algorithm. We can create artificial intelligence, Sam. Huh? Yeah, you can do that. Oh, thank you. Any other questions? We can take one last question from somebody. No. Okay. So I think we want to save. Okay, bye. Uh, is machine learning used in? Uh, the, uh, Testing for COVID and all. I know it's. A yes. So in COVID, uh, so if you get the chest X-ray, right? So there are lots of papers over that. So they, what they have done, they have taken this chest X-ray of COVID patient and non-COVID patient, and then they tried. For example, actually I missed that part. I was uh, about to talk about this thing. So this is one MRI image and CT scan image. This is something different that they have taken the image of uh, this skeleton and they are trying to uh, bound, uh, trying to identify, like make the round circle. Uh, across this uh, eye circle okay so similarly they do the boundary classification uh, boundary marking for the, like if you have chest infection you will have some blockage in your chest right so they will do marking over that and then they train their model and you can do that as well so you can perform diagnosis yes easily. yes okay. yes people have done that kind of okay for thank you patient. so uh, you can of course uh, take the questions in the snack break but before snack break we have some administrative stuff uh, before that I must mention that you had talks by three professors today and one of our advanced PhD students and she represents my group I request all of you to give a big round of applause thank you Chandran. <laughs>